Good afternoon and welcome to Bridging the Gap, Advancing America's Battery Manufacturing and Supply Chain. Before we start, please let me explain what you can expect at today's meeting. Your video and audio were automatically turned off when you joined. If you have difficulties related to technology, for example, if you can't hear a speaker or see the slide deck or visuals, we recommend you exit the webinar and re-enter. If you continue to have issues, you may also use the chat feature to send a message to AV support who will then help you troubleshoot. The public chat has been disabled. So to ask questions throughout the event, please use the Q&A function, which is the icon labeled Q&A. You may upvote and comment on questions. If you submitted a video presentation and a question applies to your organization or your presentation, we encourage you to respond using the comment option located below each question. Finally, this event is being recorded and may be made available for viewing in the next few weeks. It is now my pleasure to introduce Venkat Srinivasan, Director of Argonne Collaborative Center for Energy Storage and Science and Deputy Director of the Joint Center for Energy Storage Research at Argonne National Laboratory. Venkat, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Bethany. So good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. And thank you all for attending the LiveBridge workshop. As Bethany said, my name is Venkat Srinivasan. I'm a senior scientist at Argonne National Lab and the lead coordinator of the LiveBridge Alliance. I'll also be the MC for this workshop. So you'll see me come on and off at different points during the two days. So just to remind you, LiveBridge is a public-private partnership that is sponsored by the Department of Energy. We bring together the DOE National Lab System that's the public side of the partnership, and the three US trade associations, namely NatBat, New York Best, and New Energy Nexus. They represent the private side of the partnership. You will hear from my colleagues from the other labs today and tomorrow, and from the trade association representative in this meeting. The goal of LiveBridge is something very important. It is to create an innovation ecosystem to bridge the supply chain gap. And I think all of you know that supply chain has become extremely important. It's an extremely important topic but it wasn't so five years ago or so. And there's a reason for that. This is an amazing time to be in batteries. I've been in the battery space for 20 plus years and every few years I get really excited and I'll say something like, this is the best time to be in batteries. I think I'm finally correct. This really is the best time to be in batteries. The market for batteries in the US is booming, both for transportation and for grid applications. Over the next decade, the market demand is gonna be in the range of terawatt hours per year. Think about that for a second. It used to be not, a, you know, maybe five, six years ago, a gigawatt hour sounded like a big number. And maybe 10, 15 years ago, megawatt hour sounded like a big number. Now we are talking terawatt hours. We are in a historic moment and we have an opportunity to take advantage of this unique time that we are in. But, and there's always a but, to capture this moment, we need to build a secure supply chain in the United States from minerals all the way to battery packs. This is not a nice to have, this is a must have. Let us be very clear. There is a worldwide race to capture the battery market. The world is moving to electrification and the US industry needs to lead and capture this market. This is crucial for US competitiveness. But we also know that the growth has to be sustainable. It has to be environmentally benign, equitable, and we have to have a holistic view to satisfy all the different markets of batteries, big ones like EVs and grid storage, but also smaller ones, but critical ones like batteries for defense. LiveBridge was created to bring this holistic view and work closely with the public and private sector towards the vision of establishing a secure domestic battery supply chain. Over the next year, LiveBridge will hold a series of events to pull together the ecosystem and understand the challenges and how best to achieve this vision. This workshop is the first of that series. Over the next two days, we wanna hear from all of you about the exciting new technologies you're pursuing and the challenges you face in producing them domestically. This includes not just technological challenges and financial issues that you may be facing, but also important aspects like workforce needs, permitting issues that you might be facing, and also how do you involve the local community as we start to grow this industry. Let me quickly walk you through the agenda. At the start of today's workshop, we will hear from Argonne Lab Director Paul Kearns on the role of the national labs are playing in US innovation. This will be followed by presentations from DOE leadership on the administration's decarbonization plans and on the infrastructure bill as it applies to batteries. We will then have a short interactive session to engage all of you and get feedback on various aspects of building a domestic supply chain. We will then move to a session focused on gaining the industrial perspective. This will be in the form of recorded presentations. Thank you all for sending those presentations in and they'll be moderated by my colleagues from the different national labs. And in the end of the sort of that period, 
We'll go into a session exploring permitting challenges, workforce needs, and the role of engaging local communities and ensuring environmental justice is front and center during this growth period. We have a couple of excellent presentations from DOE leadership that are gonna be extremely important for us to understand and internalize in that session. The session tomorrow is gonna to have a similar structure to today, except for an important difference. Today's section, session is focused on the upstream part of the infrastructure bill related to battery materials processing. Tomorrow's focus is gonna be on the mid and downstream part of the supply chain related to battery manufacturing and recycling. We already have some early indications as to where the gaps might be in the US supply chain. We've got a lot more presentations for tomorrow compared to today. So tomorrow will be a longer day, but it's gonna be well worth our time just because of how important the topic is. With that, let's get the program started. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce Lab Director uh, Paul Kearns. Paul has been Argonne Lab Director since 2017, and before that, he served as the lab's chief operating officer. Paul knows the DOE complex really well. He's actually spent time in four different national labs. I've only done two, so I have a lot more to go. Throughout his career, he's been thinking hard about how to use these labs, and he can speak firsthand to the critical role the labs can play in maintaining US competitiveness. With that, let me turn this over to Paul. Thank you very much, uh, Venkat. Let me add my welcome to all of have joined uh, today's uh, Bridging the Gap workshop. Uh, it's an exciting agenda, uh, and I think we'll have a fantastic discussion. I am Paul Kearns, Director of Argonne National Laboratory, and I'm quite pleased to launch this important forum on advancing America's battery manufacturing and supply chain. The nation is pursuing a bold agenda to address the harmful effects of climate change and build a clean energy economy. And over the next two days, we'll share perspectives on the opportunities and challenges of expanding the domestic battery supply chain as widespread electrification drives demand for lithium-based batteries. For decades, the US Department of Energy's national laboratories have brought exceptional people together to address some of the most complex challenges facing society. Their pivotal discoveries redefine the possible. Climate change is one of these challenges and energy storage is part of the solution. Uh, here at Argonne, as an example, we help uh, drive battery innovations dating back to the 1960s. And today, Argonne has emerged as a leader in tracking, tackling transportation energy storage problems. Thanks to decades of sustained support from the Department of Energy's Vehicle Technologies Office. Our research and development span the full business model of uh, battery innovations. Through the Joint Center for Energy Storage, uh, a DOE Energy Innovation Hub, more than 180 researchers from across 19 partner organizations, national laboratories, university, and industry have come together to build batteries from the bottom up, atom by atom and molecule by molecule for a broad range of applications, including long duration storage for the electric grid. These promising battery materials are then scaled up from milligrams to kilograms by our scientists to help accelerate their commercial development. And to complete the value chain, we are partnering with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, NREL, and Oak Ridge National Laboratory to develop new innovations for recycling battery materials through the Department of Energy's first advanced battery recycling R&D center known as Recell. The National Laboratory System is poised for greater impact in programs such as the Energy Storage Grand Challenge and the recently announced Earthshot for Long Duration Storage, which seeks to reduce the cost of grid scale, grid scale energy storage by 90% within the decade for systems that deliver 10 or more hours of duration. This is just a sample of the breakthrough technologies that are taking place across the DOE National Laboratories in energy storage. Escalating threats from climate change make it essential that we, we redouble our efforts. The battery ecosystems faces many challenges that we look to spur development and increase output. Scarce resources, difficult overseas suppliers, and increasing cost are all obstacles to a clean energy future. For these reasons and many others, it is imperative for us to work together to bridge the battery supply chain gap. Collaborating across many different institutions and sectors will help us quickly identify problems and craft effective solutions. We are encouraged with last year's launch of the Federal Consortium for Advanced Batteries, or FCAB, and eager to contribute to this collaboration. Last year, FCAB released the National Blueprint for Lithium-Based Batteries, which described an aggressive vision to establish a domestic supply chain in batteries. Achieving the goals the vision and goals of the blueprint requires a concerted effort among our uh, government and private sector partners to develop the batteries of the future, mass produce them, and establish a resilient supply chain. 
to enable this partnership to take root, Argonne, and, <clears throat> excuse me, in partnership with DOE, created Libridge, a unique public-private alliance committed to accelerating the development of a robust and secure domestic supply chain, chain for lithium-based batteries. Libridge is focused on uh, building, uh, bridging gaps in uh, lithium battery in the lithium battery supply chain, and marks the first collaboration of its kind in the U.S. battery industry. Argonne is working with their fellow national laboratories across the country to support the public portion of Libridge. We are, we are excited that Deputy Secretary of Energy Dave, David Turk and Vice uh, President of the European Commission for Interinstitutional Relations and Foresight, Marcos Cescovic, uh, recently announced their support for collaboration between the European Battery Alliance and the Libridge Alliance to accelerate development of a robust supply chains for lithium ion batteries. Over the coming months, we will work closely with our European colleagues to build on this partnership and identify key areas for deeper collaboration. In addition to FCAB and Libridge, the administration has had made a significant investment in our research efforts. The bipartisan infrastructure law uh, allocates an additional $62 billion uh, to the US Department of Energy. It gives the department a clear mandate for technology deployment and demonstration with defined program uh, uh, responsibilities and the funding uh, to make things happen. With its resulting organizational realignment, DOE is better positioned to empower the full innovation cycle uh, from uh, research to deployment to address climate change more effectively with clean energy technologies and secure our nation's long-term economic and scientific competitiveness. And with Libridge, we have an excellent model for building public-private partnerships because we recognize industry's essential role in meeting the administration's goal for a carbon-free electric grid by 2035 and a decarbonized economy by 2050. That's why I'm pleased to see this workshop has convened leaders from across DOE, the national laboratories, academia, and certainly the private sector. It's fantastic to see more than 1,400 people registered from across 42 states, half of which are from industry. We also have 12 national laboratories and 51 universities represented here today. Uh, together, we will review 12 key aspects of the supply chain that span battery material processing to manufacturing and recycling. More than 100 videos have been submitted from U.S. companies representing all parts of the supply chain with their view on what is needed to develop a sustainable U.S. battery industry. Our discussions will aid Libridge in disseminated information on the important challenges and opportunities for industry in establishing domestic battery manufacturing. As recently described in President Biden's 100-day supply chain report on high-capacity batteries and the national blueprint for lithium batteries. We are excited to engage in these conversations with all of you. Today and tomorrow, we'll expand the role of energy storage as, an, a, pivot, as a pivotal enabling technology for deep decarbonization of the energy system. To that end, we have impactful keynote presenter, presenters and engaging, engaging panels. I certainly encourage you to contribute your expertise to the workshop, ask questions, uh, debate the issues, and share enlightening insights and promising solutions. Thank you again for being a part of today's uh, workshop. I want to express my appreciation to all the presenters and panelists who will speak today. Each is an expert in their field. They're helping industry and the scientific community bring a clean energy future to all. Lastly, we are grateful for the DOE leaders, national lab partners, and other federal and state officials who are driving this initiative. The research we do wouldn't be possible without them. Together, we are accelerating science and technology that will drive U.S. prosperity and security. Now I'm pleased to hand things over to Michael Barabee, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Sustainable Transportation at the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. In his role, Michael oversees EERE's sustainable transportation sector, which includes the vehicle, hydrogen and fuel cell, and bioenergy technologies offices. Previously, as the director of the Office of Vehicle Technologies Office, uh, Michael led an array of activities that helped reduce America's dependence on foreign oil and secure a clean energy future. He brings more than 25 years of experience to the automotive industry, specifically in the areas of environmental compliance, energy and safety policy, and product development and marketing. With that, let me welcome the Deputy Assistant Secretary. Michael, please. Thank you very much, Paul, and uh, really excited to be here. Thank you also, Ben Cat, um, 
for helping to pull all of, all of this together. Uh, as Paul said, there are a lot of national labs involved and present here. Certainly uh, many thanks to Argonne for their work in helping to lead and coordinate uh, the library partnership. But uh, I'd, I'd be remiss if not trying to at least attempt to mention many of the other ones. You'll hear from people from, uh, from NREL and Oak Ridge National Lab, um, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and our you know, partners, INL, PNNL, Brookhaven, there, there's many. Um, and the point of saying all that is this is a, a team effort, uh, not just across the federal system, but with, with all of you. So let me, um, I, I do have some slides I'd like to walk through to share with you a perspective of where we are within the Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Office at DOE and uh, where our priorities are and then bring it home to um, at least my, my view of the challenge for, uh, for the group here. I think I'd like to start by just reminding us all, and, and I know you all know this, but what is really the underlying underpinning core that is driving us is the climate crisis. And the climate crisis is calling upon us to act with urgency. The timelines that we are on are not ones being set uh, by political agenda or mandates or, or personal ones. It is by uh, the urgency of what we have to do to address climate change before us. And I think it is something that we have to remind ourselves uh, of every time. Uh, and as a result, it causes us, I think, to have to, we have to move forward in some cases, maybe quicker than we're, we're comfortable. Many of us here on the phone are scientists and engineers would like to have all the perfect data. Uh, at the end of the day, at sometimes we might have to move forward without that um, and move forward aggressively. And that is what uh, hopefully you will see we have been doing. Let me just touch on first the overall, um, the overall picture from an EERE perspective. Our overall mandate within EERE is accelerate the research, development, demonstration, and deployment of the technologies that will get us to 100% clean energy economy. 100%. That is a ambitious, audacious goal. But again, it, it is what we are called upon, what we have to do. We need to get 100% decarbonization of electric grid, 100% clean grid by 2035. Decarbonize transportation, which we'll certainly talk about more. Decarbonize energy intensive industry address the carbon footprint, footprint from our buildings and also the agricultural sector. But uh, as you'll see in the discussions today, as we talk about achieving that greenhouse gas reduction level, we have to also take into account workforce, our diversity in STEM, environmental justice and equity, and working at the state and local level. So what does economy-wide decarbonization look like? You know, here's the pie chart. Um, this is where the emissions are. We have to address every single piece of those, and that's within EERE what we are setting out to do. Not to have a vague general goal, but to lay out specific plans within each one of these. So within transportation, the transportation is the largest source overall of greenhouse gas emissions, as many of you know. This shows you the breakdown of where those emissions are. Cars, trucks, medium and heavy duty, off-road, aviation, rail, maritime. We need to address every single one of those pieces. We have to take into account, of course, that you know, transportation is a huge expense. I mean, today it's obviously front and center in front of all of us with the rise in gas prices because of the uh, invasion and war in Ukraine. But, um, but even before that, transportation was still the second highest expense for a typical American household. So that is something we have to take into account as well as the global competitiveness. I mean, again, the, the current world economic and political situation is reminding us again of the critical nature of the energy economy and that we need to do everything to reduce that volatility in our energy economy overall. You know, in the other key aspect, as we're doing this, we have to remember transportation drives the business of our economy. It drives literally right, the people's ability to get to work, get to school, uh, get to healthcare, live their lives daily. So we have to make sure that we're providing a transportation system that works. And we have to recognize that we're going to have growth in our transportation as our economy grows, which we certainly want it to. We also will recognize there'll be an increased need and demand for transportation. So we can't stifle that. We can't cut our way to zero. We have to find technological solutions as well as economic ones, and ones that work for everyday people. So what does that look like? You know, achieving net zero, it's going to require us to change from the status quo dramatically. 
So here are kind of key points from our perspective of what that strategy looks like. First, we have to recognize that incremental change doesn't get us there. We need a discontinuous pathway. And to achieve our goal of net zero by 2050, in transportation, we have to be fully deployed by 2035 across trains, planes, cars, buses, across almost every mode because of the length of the use cycle of the vehicle. To hit 2035 requires that right now, this year, we, be implement, we are implementing. I'm very proud to say it, as Paul uh, Vincat uh, alluded to, I mean, every day you're hearing the announcements that do indicate we are moving, but we have to continue to move at this pace for a number of years. I think we also have to recognize that the magnitude of change we are talking about, we're not talking about a 10 and 20% reduction, 100% decarbonization. We are impacting every person's life in every industry. We have to find market pull solutions. Now, policy will be critical, and we'll talk a lot about that today and the, the funding that the federal government can provide. But at the end of the day, we can't just mandate our way there. We have to find solutions that do have a market pull basis if we're going to affect this amount of the economy overall. As I mentioned before, we have to recognize the growth of mobility. And when you do that, when you look at all the options, the, the simple math is that we have to have fundamental fuel switching to low-carbon fuels, like batteries, that are powered by a clean electric grid, and also vehicle, uh, vehicle level efficiency improvements. Those are the only things that get us the magnitude of change that we need to achieve. Certainly, achieving 100% clean electricity grid will also be critical. We in our, are assuming that. Now, I, I'm lucky. I, uh, that's one part of that I, uh, I don't personally have to I worry about, but I don't personally have to be responsible for. But I have many colleagues at DOE who are focused on exactly that. And... As was mentioned, batteries that we were talking about today are going to be a key role in achieving that overall clean electric grid, as well as hydrogen, we believe. So the work we're doing here, while you know, I'm speaking to it from a transportation perspective, we have to recognize they're also going to be critically important for the grid. And of course, we have to address every mode of transportation. So that's the framing from our perspective of how we're viewing the overall strategy. So as was said, batteries will be critical to this. And the good news is that there has been a tremendous amount of move in the last year on the government and private sector side. On the government, nearly $7 billion in the infrastructure bill for batteries directly, $7.5 billion in EV charging infrastructure, as well as over $10 billion more in specific demand signals through electrifying school buses, electrifying transit buses, uh, as well as the government fleet itself. And that's been matched by, just to date, $71.5 billion. This infographic on the right from the uh, Alliance for Automotive Info, uh, Innovation it just shows the tremendous amount of announcements. Every single day, right, you're all seeing it, how much is being announced. I worked for many years in the automotive industry. I sat in the boardroom approving product decisions or pitching them to the CEO. The level of change here that is happening is absolutely a clear signal that every major automotive maker has basically thrown their hat in and said, we are all in. This is where we're going. There is no turning back. We have to make now the cost work, the battery availability work, and the supply chain. So uh, this chart on the left, again, borrowing a little from the uh, auto innovators. I appreciate their, uh, their graphics here. So you look at the battery plant capacity we currently have and what's been announced so far. 284 gigawatt hours by 2026. Huge, huge increase in the amount that's been announced. But as you all know, we have to go a lot further than that. But this is a tremendous initial start. But then let's dig a little deeper. And Dave Howell will talk a lot more about this. And this gets a lot to our strategy of working on processing and components. When you look at cathode share or anode separator electrolyte, you know, it probably can different sources for these numbers. They might be off a little bit one way or the other, depending on what you look at. But the, the story is clear, right? Where we are now, and including where our development is, which currently is, is pretty low, we are way behind critical world powers like China. If we are going to have an independent supply chain, we are going to have dramatic increases in these pieces. And that is what it's called for. And that is where we are going to be focusing our investment and really are asking for you in the private sector to partner with us. So let me just say, um, I, I work for a CEO who has uh, had a famous saying, right? Hope is not a plan. It's amazing how many times, you know, you come in the presentation and say, well, we hope this, and people use it kind of colloquially. But 
hope is not a plan. And the, as I mentioned, the goals we have laid out here are not going to achieve by themselves. They're going to need a plan. It might be an audacious plan. It might have 100 steps. It's a very high risk plan. But if you don't have a plan, we'll never get there. So I just want to you know, take you a, a quick walk through. Um, I, I view Dave, Dave Hall and I as partners in this over the last year and a half. Um, as we sat down, I remember well exactly saying, David, how are we going to get there? Well, September 2020, um, really with, with his vision, we launched the Federal Consortium on Advanced Batteries, pulling together 17 agencies. And we did that because we had a vision of what had to happen next and next after that. But we said, first, we have to get all the federal government together on one page. And that led to developing the first national battery industrial strategy. This is not something the U.S. does well, laying out industrial strategies. We tend to be more of a let the free market go there. But with the type of change we have, again, it's not going to happen by itself. That strategy laid out the critical aspects that then informed the overall the American jobs plan that was put forward by the president. It also helped inform the demand signal. Our strategy, first and foremost, was if we don't have a clear demand signal, it doesn't make a difference. What else we do, the investment will not be here. So the president, the automotive industry, and I thank all of you on the phone here today, as well as labor, announced last August a goal of 50% of sales as EVs by 2030, as well as the work we're doing on electrifying transit and buses and the federal fleet. This is critical because it now gives worldwide investors a strong sense, okay, there will be a market there. We can invest. We then move forward to the historic LiBridge public-private partnership. I will say that I, uh, I am very proud of the work DOE has done. I, I've only been at DOE five or six years. I cannot take credit for this. But DOE and the work in the Vehicle Technologies Office and the National Labs is developing a industry-government collaboration now for decades plus, as Ben Katz said, has been historic. I see that this year was a major turning point to take that relationship and bring it to the next level one that will actually help us deliver the ultimate market here. This library public private partnership is, uh, is nothing short of that, and that is how we are viewing it. Of course, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which uh, was passed again early on, we laid out this strategy of what was needed, and uh, the president and Congress responded and supported our request in there. And as Paul said, uh, just this week, Deputy Secretary Turk and I met with the vice president uh, for the European uh, Commission, and agreed to a new transatlantic partnership between the European Battery Alliance and the U.S. Libraries Alliance to really drive a much more coordinated and um, aggressive forward-leaning approach to developing batteries across the U.S. and Europe. So where does that bring us to? I just want to reemphasize what you'll be hearing later today. The public-private partnership is going to be the key to our success. Government will play a huge role here. We can be the convener, we can set the signal and the overall message, but we cannot do this alone by any stretch. The scale is huge. We need two terawatt hours, seven times the current announced capacity by 2035. Our goal is nothing short of that, two terawatt hours. We have to achieve that level. We have to put the plans in place now so we can grow and then grow in the next five years and grow in the next five years. Energy security and cost. Addressing a domestic industry, especially the processing and the battery components, is going to be critical. If we don't do that, we will have price volatility, we'll have security volatility, and we will not achieve our overall goals. We have a great opportunity here, not just with electrification, but also our work on hydrogen and on biofuels, which will help us with things like aviation and some off-road to diversify our overall energy supply and reduce the historic volatility that we've seen and we're seeing right now. And then let me just hit these last two points, critically important, workforce transition, and the fact that we have to bring all Americans along with us. If we're going to achieve this level of change, we're asking every person in this country to change the type of fuel they're using, how they fuel their vehicle. We're asking every business to change that. They have to see this in themselves. They can't say, I, electric car, I don't see that. You know, I think a lot of people have commented to me that they've been just amazed as they watched the Super Bowl and they watched the Olympics or college football the last few months. You can't help but sense something's different here. Right? All of us live and breathe batteries, electrification, and, and issues around energy, but the average American doesn't. They need to be able to see that their basic daily needs are being met, and it has to address all Americans. We have to address equity 
in what we're doing in environmental justice. That includes working with the local communities where if we're going to be having actual mineral extraction here in the U.S. being done responsibly and with the support and the buy-in from those local communities, we have to make sure that the actual vehicles and the affordability can be addressed to all Americans as well. And we have to think about those people that are currently making engines or transmissions for internal combustion engine vehicles or the fossil fuels that power the electric grid. Those communities are going to be in transition. And we have to make sure that the investment that we're making and this is going to be absolutely, I will guarantee you, from the secretary down, a top, top priority in all our investments. Make sure we are focusing on those communities in transition and that they can benefit from this clean energy economy because they will feel the brunt of that transition. So I'd ask all of you, as you're thinking about your investments, to think about that and to take that in mind. And I, I, I've been on the business side. I've been in the boardroom. I think that we all have to remember that our end goal is only going to be met if everyone buys into this together as a country. So, you know, with that, I'll just end with this thought. You know, my, my title is uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Sustainable Transportation. A sustainable transportation approach, while it achieves our technical goal for decarbonization, it also has to meet everyone's needs. It has to be affordable. And it has to address local environmental issues as well as greenhouse gas, air quality, water quality, those things, including those communities that have been historically burdened by, by those issues. So as we're thinking about major industrial changes, we have to think about these things and make sure we are addressing these as well. So with that, uh, I, will, I will end there. And I, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to kind of share uh, some of our vision, my vision with all of you, uh, and uh, really look forward to the rest of the day today. I'm going to hand it over now to David Howell, the director for the Vehicle Technologies Office. He, he probably needs no introduction to, to this group, but uh, let me just say, I think we all owe a great uh, debt to David and uh, his entire team at uh, the Vehicle Technologies Office and the labs who have really helped lead the vision and gotten us to where we are today. David, all yours. Thank you, Michael. Um, uh, and certainly a uh, great overview of the um, of the strategy for the Department of Energy on decarbonization. I have the privilege of providing a little, the next level down of how the bipartisan infrastructure law um, will support the, the, the build out of a battery supply chain um, um, over, the next, over the next five years or more. Um, so with that, uh, Bethany, which if you, if you would go to the next slide. So, you know, Michael's already done this, EER program priorities, decarbonizations across many sectors. Uh, next uh, click, Bethany. And obviously there's a, a key link on high capacity batteries within um, enabling any of these decarbonization strategies across these modes. And, and specifically, as you know, um, batteries are key to electrification and electrification of transportation is key to realizing our decarbonization goals but also for grid and for these other areas as well, stationary batteries and battery technology will certainly be an enabler uh, across these fields as well. So this is a really, really growing and important area. And next slide. Um, you've probably seen this slide. I certainly hope you have. It, it appeared um, not only in the National Blueprint for Lithium Batteries, but also the, the 100 day supply chain report in response to the president's executive order on on, on the domestic supply chains. But when you really look at the projections um, um, at, at this time last year, um, in terms of global expansion of lithium battery demand and global expansion of manufacturing capacity, you see this trend. And um, you know whether it's the low, low bar or the high bar, the trend is it's up over, over, um, over the next uh, you know, five to 10 years. And what we've noticed is the, the later projections, the ones in 2020 and 2021, seem to be more and more accurate. And as you get into more and more projections, as Michael said, the, the acceleration even, even grows rapidly. Um, next click, Bethany. And uh, this time last year, uh, we were growing from 59 gigawatt hours of capacity, battery production capacity in the United States, uh, specifically lithium ion battery production capacity. Um, in 2020, um, from 59 gigawatt hours to a projected 2024 gigawatt hours in 2025, um, and those were announced announced uh, announcements of, of plans by industry to install this 
in additional um, production capacity. As Michael just mentioned, when you look at the new uh, projections, that 224 gigawatt hours goes, goes is now 340 gigawatt hours by 2026. So what we're seeing is the, the projections are maturing, are, are, are materializing within, within, within the United States. And so battery capability, particularly high capacity batteries, such as lithium batteries, are gonna be very, very important for our economy going forward. Uh, next slide. I mentioned the president's executive order on America's supply chains and the 100 day report. And this was a federal effort uh, that DOE had the privilege of leading. Uh, but I'll underscore this was truly a federal effort and engaged with our industry partners here in the United States. Uh, we looked at the, the critical risks associated with a high capacity supply chain for, 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 for advanced batteries, all the way from upstream where that's raw, you know, where are the raw materials, where they produced things like lithium, cobalt, nickel, and graphite, moving to midstream and downstream, you know, materials processing capability. Um, compo uh, component processing, you know, the materials processing such as precursor development, um, materials processing um, such as cathodes and advanced separators and things of that nature, cell manufacturing pack, manufacturing all the way to end of, end of life. And we identified some key vulnerabilities, of course, um, in the upstream and, and early midstream, you know, class one nickel, lithium and cobalt are the primary supply chain vulnerabilities, but there are others as well as, as identified in the report. In the midstream area, in that material processing area, um, vulnerabilities such as uh, uh, a, we have a significant deficit in, in mineral refi refining and, and, and processing, you know, that stage of the, of the materials um, supply chain that's just before you get into a component battery, uh, such as a, a cathode. And of course, going to midstream, you know, cathode and nano production, as Michael showed. Oops, if we could go back one slide. Yeah, and um, so in, in the cathode area, um, in anode area, production capacity is sorely lacking as Michael showed on that slide. And I think this is going to give me a little trouble here. Um, but across, across the supply chain, all major battery components, uh, including cell production, you know, as Michael mentioned in, in his presentation, we need to get up to two terawatt hours of capacity, even in cell production. And of course, on downstream, you know, the U.S. lacks other markets in lithium battery recycling I mean, with less than 5% recycle a year, and we need to change that. Um, now the next slide. So thank you. Um, so, uh, and Michael mentioned FCAB, the federal consortium uh, in the national blueprint. And in parallel to that 100-day report, the, the federal agencies uh, band together to develop the strategy for us and hopefully for, for industry as well signifying th uh, five key goals that we're trying to achieve over the next 10 years across the battery supply chain, whether it's in minerals, battery materials, cells and packs, recycling, and innovation. And we've outlined key activities that we will take on as a federal agencies, either um, in, our, in our routine daily mission space or even collaboratively um, across the federal agencies to achieve those key targets. So we're marching out right now. We've developed working groups across these spaces to assure that the federal agencies um, um, are actually um, working together and synergistically in order to achieve these goals. You know, as Michael said, that's 17 federal agencies, but represents about 50 offices within those agencies. And, you know, um, you know we, DOE has the privilege, privilege of leading this effort, but, you know, um, it is truly a, a cross the federal government effort. And our leadership also includes the Department of Defense, Department of Commerce and the State Department as well. Um, next slide. So the, the bipartisan infrastructure law, and I'm sure everyone knows this, but it included several provisions uh, to, to build out, to help build out that battery ecosystem. And provision one for 0207B, is, is focused on battery material processing grants. And it provided $3 billion over the next five years, you know, basically $600 million a year to um, support the build out of, of the separation of materials from extracted feedstocks. And of course, as I mentioned, materials are processing or refining. That money will be matched minimally uh, by industry 
So this is a minimum of a six billion dollar play over the next over the next five years plus. And then, of course, associated that and in parallel, there's section 40207C, and that's for battery manufacturing and recycling grants. Again, three billion dollars total over five years, matched by industry, so a six billion dollar play. And that focus is on component processing uh, you know, of, of battery components uh, such as anodes, cathodes, electrolytes, and such. Um, also, cell manufacturing, pack manufacturing, and the establishment of recycling facilities across the United States. There's a, also another provision uh, that I'll speak on today. It's really uh, focused on research development and demonstration in the um, end of life recycling and reuse area. That's section 40208. It's called um, electric drive vehicle um, battery processing and second use. That's $200 million over the next, um, over, over the next five years, 40 million a year to, uh, to perform research development and demonstration in that space. Also, I wanted to talk about the structure, uh, particularly in 40207B and 40207C. This was given to us by Congress signed into law. And so the focus is on grants, uh, cost shared grants, as I mentioned, uh, in three categories, battery materials demonstration projects, new commercial scale battery material processing facilities, and retooling and re retrofit and expanding existing battery material processing facilities for 207B. For 207C, similarly, demonstration projects for battery component manufacturing, battery manufacturing and recycling, um, also, new commercial scale facilities uh, for battery component manufacturing and battery manufacturing and recycling, and of course, retool, retrofit, or expansion of existing facilities. And we also provided um, uh, language uh, from Congress on the amount of a grant award, as you see here, shall not be less than $50 million uh, for demonstrations, $100 million for, for new facilities, and not less than $50 million for retool, retrofit, or expanded facilities. That's the government share. So um, the minimum award then is total award would be 100 million, 200 million, and, three, and, and 100 million in each of these categories when you take into account industry cost share. So next slide, please. So in 207B, this, you know, these are the, the major areas uh, that, that we're focused on and this, you know, this uh, I will also call out our sister offices within within the Advanced Manufacturing Office and the Fossil Energy and Carbon Management Office as well, uh, working together uh, to pull together the plan here. So it really um, you know, works itself out in two major areas. It's it's domestic mineral separation of extracted feedstocks, um, materials like lithium, cobalt, nickel, graphite as you see here in other materials that are central to high capacity batteries. Um, and then also the domestic refinement of, of, of materials and purification of battery, battery grade materials as you see here on the, on, the, um, on the bottom side of this um, chart. And of course, scale up and demonstration projects as well, not only of um, uh, you know, new, new, processing, new processing capability for separation of materials, uh, maybe from separation of materials from things like non-conventional feedstocks and things of that nature. So what we're trying to do is keep this very wide open in the high capacity battery space and uh, not, um, not prescribe uh, these things and, and, uh, and, and, and see you know, get input from industry uh, via meetings like this and ultimately through your application process and then go from there. Uh, next slide. So similarly on 40207C, the battery manufacturing and recycling grants, you know, in this space, you know, areas of support, uh, production facilities such as state-of-the-art lithium ion battery cell production, you know, cathode active materials like, you know, NMC, NCA, NMC and LFP and others, um, separator production, anode production and recycling facilities are the key. There's other things that we want to uh, support if possible. Um, alternative battery technologies like sodium ion, um, if feasible, uh, other production plants like pack assembly plants, electrolyte mixing plants, 
binders and concurrent collectors and things of that such. So that will work itself out in the application process, but we want to keep things open so um, so industry can decide um, you know the applications that you want to to apply apply for. Um, scale up demonstration uh, focus will be on next generation, either you know things like silicon anode materials, next generation lithium metal and solid state and the like, um, or new processes associated with current uh, technologies to drive down the price of manufacturing batteries or increase um, increase performance of, of batteries. Uh, next slide. So um, hopefully you've seen the notice of intent that we released on February the 11th, 2022. Included 12 topics of interest, um, supporting, as I mentioned, new retrofitted and expanded domestic facilities for battery recycling and, and the production of materials, cell components, battery manufacturing, and all large-scale demonstrations broken out in, in these areas. This is our first phase. So uh, first tranche of, of um, of, of, of our um, activities associated with BIL. We do expect um, at least one or two more phases over the next five years uh, to fill in gaps uh, where needed and to continue to increase the, the innovation in, in the battery manufacturing space across these areas. Um, the notice of intent includes a frequently asked questions where you can ask questions about the notice of intent um, publicly and you'll get public answers for all to see and a partnering list as well. If you're interested in signing up, you may not uh, feel that you're a, a primary uh, applicant, but possibly um, could be a, 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 a sub, sub applicant or sub, uh, subcontract on, on a, a primary applicants team or even state and local um, entities uh, can put themselves on a, on this partnering list, tribes and you know, EJ communities as well. So um, please, um, if you haven't done so and you're interested in partnering with possible um, applicants, uh, please use the partnering list as well to, to put your interest out there. Um, next slide. So I, I mentioned the section 40208, the electric drive vehicle battery and recycling and second life application program. And so, um, that's a research development and demonstration program, a little different. Yeah, okay, the first program was really on building out the, the uh, facilitization of, of production plants and large scale demonstrations uh, to scale up you know, pilot plants. You know, this is our traditional research development and demonstration activities here. Um, next slide, please. And of course, we, you know, we, we do adhere to the language that we get. Um, uh, from in the bill and uh, the focus on this provision was on second life applications for electric drive vehicle batteries and um, technologies and processes for the final recycling and disposal of electric drive vehicle batteries. So a lot of, a lot of the terms used, you know, used are processing uh, with respect to the battery material, which is refining the material, treating, baking, coating processes and things of that nature. And of course, the term recycling means the recovery of materials from spent batteries to be reused in similar applications. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and you know, I just want to emphasize, you know, recycling is a key part of our of our um, strategy in terms of the, of setting up a domestic supply of key battery materials. Um, uh, it can provide some substantial quantities of materials that are going to be needed in the future. It can reduce cost, it can reduce energy use, water needs, and emissions, as you see here. Just uh, the front uh, the horizontal bar, you know, you can get one ton of battery grade lithium from 750 tons of brine, 250 tons of ore, or 28 tons of spent lithium ion batteries. And this cuts across, you know, each of the key uh, materials that are in batteries. And as I mentioned, you can significantly reduce the cost of the materials, energy use, water, and, and emissions. And, and this graph on the right side, um, on, the, on the right bottom, shows the potential uh, over time of supplying significant cobalt and nickel to the lithium battery industry uh, through the recycling and recovery of materials from 
from recycled spent batteries. And of course that will go down because the amount of cobalt that's expected over time in a, in a, in a lithium battery for electric vehicles and for, and for stationary applications, that amount of cobalt is expected to go down as well. So you know, there'll be less available in, in a recycled feedstock, but there will also be less needed as well. Um, next slide, please. So uh, one of the notices of intent that we released on February the 11th um, included uh, a, a notice of intent for a potential funding opportunity um, uh, in this space. Um, and this is really, a, it says to invest 3 billion to strengthen. That was the overarching um, title of the release, but this is a r roughly a $60 million effort, uh, first tranche, and then over time, we'll continue to put funding opportunities out in this space in the $40 million space. Focus here is on two topics, the recycling, processing, and reintegration of, of, of uh, materials into the battery supply chain. And of course, demonstrations of second use uh, for uh, electric drive vehicle batteries. Now, again, you see there's a notice of intent and frequently asked questions um, available to you from the notice of intent website here. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, key milestones mentioned February 11th already. Uh, this spring, we do expect to release a funding opportunity announcement in both of these areas. Um, over the summer, um, review applications. And then of course, in the fall of 2022, hopefully we'll have selections announced. And so um, next slide. I would like to thank you. I'd like to uh, thank you for participating. Your input is really, really important to us. You know, this as, as Michael mentioned, you know, this is a team effort. This is a all of government effort and all of industry and, and, and sort of all of the ecosystem effort, including research, development, and um, innovation space to, to meet our, our decarbonization goals, but also to stand up a resilient supply chain for, for high capacity batteries. And I um, appreciate uh, everything that uh, Lybridge Alliance has done to pull this together for us. Uh, you know, we're in listening mode from the federal government. So we look forward to hearing what your thoughts are here and uh, filling, it, filling us in on if there's gaps that we missed um, that we can possibly fill in um, now or in the future. And of course, I uh, really appreciate the Library Alliance pulling this together, Argonne National Laboratory, your team, and um, thank Paul Kern specifically for, for his leadership here and um, all the national laboratory leadership as well to, to help, the, help the, um, the Department of Energy and in our vision in this space. And, and, but most of all, definitely want to thank you as stakeholders for taking your time out to do the videos, taking your time out to provide input to us because it's really, really important as we go forward to get this right. So with that, I'll say thank you and turn it back over to Vincap. Dave, thank you so much. I deeply appreciate the presentation. That was really fantastic. And, uh, and so, so to Michael, I think it set the tone for what we're trying to do here. So we're gonna sort of switch gears a little bit and move into a bit of a discussion section. And the way we're gonna do that is uh, we're gonna move into a sort of a software called Poll Everywhere. So for those of you who haven't used this before, it's best used on a website. So my suggestion is that uh, you should log into this website that you see there, Poll ev.com slash argon1. Again, go to a web browser, type in polev.com slash argonne -E, and the number one. I'll give you a second there to sort of uh, do that. So please do that. Uh, turns out that I'm seeing a few people that have called in using a phone. This particular uh, sort of system doesn't work but very, very well when you start using it in terms of uh, doing it on a, on a phone itself. I see the first question has actually popped up. Of, you know, the first question is being, do you own an electric car? Um, so you, for people on the phone, you actually can type an answer to this uh, by typing argon1 to the number 22333. So again, the recipient should be 22333, and the text message should be sent as A-R-G-O-N-N-E -N -E, and the number one. When you do that, you will see a text response that says joining argon session. After you see the prompt, you'll be able to respond to the polls but I will urge you that you should probably go to a computer because there are some questions that are gonna come up that are not gonna be something that you can address or, or even sort of look at on your phone. So I, I encourage you to sort of use your web browser if you can. 
So we're going to have a couple of quick questions. The one that you see on the screen now, do you own an electric plug-in vehicle? It's a simple on uh, yes and no question. What will happen is that if you don't like the answer, you can always change your mind, but hopefully you all know what you own. Um, so you know, let's give you some numbers. I think the US right now is approximately 17% uh, electric vehicles, right? I think if I remember this correctly, looks like uh, this crowd is uh, sort of approximately where it needs to be. Uh, again, I see the numbers sort of moving around, which means more of you are joining the website. Let's give it but just a minute to make sure that all of you are able to get to that site. So again, the website is poilev.com slash argon1. So I have a couple of questions that are kind of simple, and then we're going to go that's just so that you get familiar with the software and kind of how it works, and then we'll get into some meaty discussions. So I will say in the meantime, as we're looking into this, that I actually don't own an electric car. Uh, I will say in my defense that I've got one car that is 14 years old, another that is nine, and all my friends in the LCA world tell me that I'm better off doing what I'm doing and keeping my cars for 15 to 20 years for buying an electric car. So it's a great way for cheap people like me to have an out uh, and sort of saying that I'm being actually very, very clean by not buying a new car when I don't have to. All right, so this is fantastic. It looks like you guys have all logged in. It looks like you guys know what you're doing. Again, I encourage you to go to the website and not do it using a phone if you don't have to. Let us now go into something a little bit more complicated, a question that will be the next question, question number two, where we're gonna ask you a prediction in the future. So it's 2030, you've heard from Michael and from Dave in terms of where we wanna go. What do you think will be the percentage of US cars that will be electric? That's the question. And again, I wanna remind you today, it's 3% of new car sales is electric, right? So the question we're asking you is, where do you think this will end up going? And remember now, we're hoping that we'll be around 50% as we get to the 2030 targets. So we're asking you to sort of do this. Again, if you don't like the answer, it will give you an option to kind of click and sort of change your uh, response. And that hopefully will give you a chance to sort of uh, see what is it that you're doing if by mistake you kind of click on something you didn't mean to click on. Again, the question is, what is your prediction for where we will be in 2030? Let's give it a minute so that we can get people to respond. When you see the bars jumping, it means that people are actually still logging in and doing things on this question. I will say that at uh, Poll Everywhere, uh, po sometimes you will see a lag. You might still be in the previous question. For those of you who are not on question two, give it a second. You may need to refresh your browser. This hasn't happened to me. Mine seems to work pretty well, but if you're having any issues because of low internet bandwidth, that might be something you have to do. So you can see where things stand. It looks like uh, some people, at least a small percent, believe that we'll be getting up to the 60 to 80% mark. This is really fantastic. Uh, I guess we missed the 40 to 60 in this question here. So there could be a wide range of people that are actually thinking about the box in between the 20 and 40 and 60 and 80. Uh, and then it looks like some people are not that uh, uh, optimistic. They think it'll be still in the low numbers. I don't see anybody saying it'll be more than, more than 80%. So which is probably logical. I think that question is probably just there for you guys to kind of look at and see what's going on. So. This is great. So these two questions are just there so that you can sort of get familiar with the actual system itself. We are now going to go into a little bit more of a meaty discussion. So let's go to question three, Bethany, if that's okay with you. So this is an, a ranking question. And the question we're asking you is, you've all heard these multiple things that are going on, right? Elements in the lithium ion uh, supply chain where you have these criticalities. Uh, there are different elements we worry about, you know, lithium, nickel, cobalt. Uh, and the question we're asking you is rank them in the order of criticality. And just to give you a sense for how this is going to work, when you go and so if you go to this website, you will see and you hover your mouse on the options that you're interested in. Say you're interested in a particular element that you think is the top one. You will see an up arrow and a down arrow. And then your job is to very simply sort of click on those arrows to get it to the right spot. And then you will go to the other ones. This is going to take a little bit of time, is my suspicion. So I'm going to give you guys a chance to take the time to reorder them carefully. Obviously, you will see these things moving back and forth, depending on how this works. Uh, I'm noticing that uh, various people have various thoughts on this. So let us take about a moment to make sure that we get these answers to where we think we need to be. Again, I'll remind you that uh, every battery we're talking about, uh, at least the ones that are commercial today, has lithium, has nickel, has cobalt, has manganese, has graphite. We're hoping to move towards silicon. We may move to solid state lithium metal in the future. We're also hoping to eliminate or minimize the amount of nickel and cobalt as we go into the next 10 years. But certainly the question we're asking is, today, when you look at this, where do you think things stand? And it looks like we are seeing the emergence of what I would not call a consensus, but certainly a, a sense that 
lithium is a very important challenge that we face, certainly a very important element as we look to the future. Uh, I think many of you have, uh, watching the Q&A have seen that there are multiple alternate technologies, things like sodium that people are considering, but certainly the TRL level of those technologies tend to be lower than where we are in lithium. Nickel is interesting. Uh, I think we all saw what happened last week uh, when uh, nickel tra trading had to stop in the metal, metal exchange because of the Ukraine uh, situation. So certainly that's an that's a increasingly, I think, important problem that everybody's worrying about. Cobalt obviously is, has, was big, will be big. And I'm sort of uh, sort of interested in the fact that you know graphite showed up next makes sense. We didn't include copper in this question because we're trying to focus more on the sort of the active elements, but certainly copper comes up multiple times as a topic that needs to be carefully considered. So I see a couple of bars quickly moving, so I'll just give it another minute before we get into this into the sort of the next question, if you will. So let's give it a give it give it about a minute. All right, I don't think we're gonna change these bars too much. Again, all of this information that you're recording is something that we are capturing and it's gonna be an important part of what I think uh, will form the discussion as we go to the future. And as we start to think deeply about how we as a country can start to eliminate some of the problems that you see that you're articulating here. So uh, the next question, before we get to it, I wanna just explain what you're gonna see. This is what is called a clickable image. So you're gonna see an image. The image is gonna be a flowchart. It's actually the exact flowchart you saw in Dave Howell's presentation, which showed the upstream, midstream, downstream, which is what you're seeing now on the screen. Uh, what you will see is that uh, when you go to the browser, you might have to scroll in the browser in some cases to see the full image. The question we're asking you is, which part of the supply chain do you think represents the biggest challenge in developing a secure domestic battery industry? If you don't like where you clicked, my suggestion is go to the bottom of the screen, below the image, you will see a clear response button. In every one of these questions, there's a way to so you'll either see a trash can or a clear response. Click on that and then you can get back and uh, reorder this. So again, the question we're asking is, where do you think the biggest challenges are in the supply chain? Uh, hypothetically, you can sort of think of this as, uh, if somebody has a lot of money, say in the order of $7 billion, I don't know exactly who has it, they might be thinking about where to invest those dollars. So this is an opportunity for you all to weigh in on where you think the biggest challenges are. And I see a lot of arrows showing up in the top of the flow chart, which is really fantastic. Uh, what I'm gonna do in the meantime is I'm gonna see if I can add a question into the Q&A window for people who are very good at sort of doing this fast. And I'm gonna ask one of my colleagues who are on the back end of this to sort of release that question if they see it. What I'm hoping that you guys will do is tell us more about what it is that you're seeing that is telling you to click on that particular spot in the image. For example, if you clicked on the very top of the image in the upstream part, what happened? What do you see in your world? Tell us those stories because that's gonna be very important for us as we move forward. I'm seeing a lot more icons now kind of showing up in the recycling part, which is also obviously extremely important as we heard from others. Again, I, I want to see if the Argon team can release my question if they see it. I see questions coming up in chat. I would encourage you to use the Q&A window. I am told that they're not able to see the question. So let me try it again. I thought I was being fancy by logging in through two machines, but Maybe that is not. I still see things moving. I am trying to add the question, but it's having difficulty, I think, in picking it up for some reason. So again, uh, what, what I'm, I'm gonna suggest is that if you guys use the Q&A window, not the chat window, to tell us a few stories about what you think the biggest challenges are and why you clicked on where you clicked on. But you can see the results of this. A lot of interest, I think, in the upstream, the, in the sort of the part of the diagram or the midstream part of the diagram, and certainly interest in the end of life recycling part of the diagram. All right, so let us go to the next question. So the next question is what we call an open-ended question. 
what we're asking you is one of the important things to think about is that in the United States, we just don't have cobalt and nickel, right? You are where you are and the ground has what it has and you can't, your business plan can be, let's wait for a meteor to fall on our soil. So the question we're asking is what unconventional sources should we be using to, to, to address this problem, right? You, you guys already clicked on various things like lithium as a problem, nickel as a problem, cobalt. Tell us what you think is going on in five words or less. So, you know, you know channel your inner Hemingway when you do this so that we don't see long answers here. I see exactly what people should be doing. They're typing in the answers, the two words, three words. This is fantastic. Geothermal brine, certainly something that is going on in the Salton Sea. Uh, I can see, you know, collaborations with allies. Oh, that's fantastic. Seabed mining, you know, that's, a, that's an important topic. I think that is uh, gaining interesting. I see another one with global partnerships. I will say that uh, both, I think all three speakers uh, today after me talk, told you about the U EU LiveBridge connections or the EBA LiveBridge connections that we're hoping to build on. Recycling metal hydride batteries. Uh, that's interesting, actually. Now, the seawater is sort of uh, becoming very, very interesting for a lot of people, I believe. So, petroleum coke, yeah. Cobalt mine in Idaho, that is interesting. I mean, I don't know if that's a, would you call that an unconventional source? Maybe you do, that's, that, 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 that's a great one. So keep the answers coming. You can sort of see them, they're coming at a good pace. Uh, again, we're capturing all this. Uh, we deeply appreciate the fact that you guys are taking the time to do this. I could see more people talking about, uh, oh yeah, streamlining permission. Keep that in mind, whoever put that in, because we're gonna be talking about permission very, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, permitting very soon, uh, both later in the day and again tomorrow. So. Now, overseas collaborations, seawater, you can see these various things coming up. Urban mining, yep, very important topic. Yeah, I see more of recycling. Yeah, this is fantastic. Yeah, you know, this is fantastic. You guys are talking about uh, regulations and issues of that nature. I actually have another uh, Q&A question for later in the day, specifically on that topic and certainly an important question to address. Uh, as we go to the afternoon session for people who are uh, thinking hard about the whole permitting challenge, please let us know. Again, Q&A is a great place for you to sort of tell us a little bit more about what your challenges are. We want to capture that and we want to convey that to the relevant uh, stakeholders. Large deposits in Canada, yep, very important. Synthetic carbide, yep, this is fantastic. This is really great, guys. I mean, I'm, I, you know, I, I don't know how others, uh, I think are gonna, this is a gold mine of information. So thank you, this is really fantastic. So I'm kind of seeing, I see a response that is more than five words, but a good one nonetheless. This question is uh, really going well. I think all of you have a lot of things to say. Uh, I'm gonna suggest that we maybe give it a minute or so and move to the next topic. I still see responses coming in. And I would hate to cut people off and things that they're very interested in communicating. So I'm gonna suggest we wait for just another minute, if that's okay. I see a lot of recurring themes, seawater, uh, global partnerships, main tailings, yep. I see the, you know, the old salt and sea areas, brine aquifers, yep, this is great. Volcanic residues, that's a new one. That's very interesting. I assume that's a seabed exploration. Yep, that makes sense. All right, folks, in the interest of getting more questions and answers, I thank you all for taking the time to do this. I apologize that even though you're still typing things, we're gonna to move to the next question. But I think we are seeing a number of recurring themes here and that's just a you know, gold man of information. So thank you for that. 
So Bethany, if you're okay with that, we should probably move to the next question. So uh, this is an important question that we're gonna ask you. Uh, as you can kind of think about it, right? Uh, you probably are aware of the fact that there's gonna be this need for us to think about, uh, uh, you know, there are new suppliers for things that are coming on board. This could be a new, you know, you, know you, you may be saying, you know, I have a company that's doing seabed mining, or you might have a company that's saying, you know, I have a new way of getting cobalt into these things. So the question we're asking is, uh, you know, when you are a new supplier, how do you rank the importance of uh, the different things that you would do before you say that I'm going to sign a contract with you guys and sort of you know, use your material or use your sort of your precursor that you're having. So we have a few different things. Again, this is a ranking question. So hover your mouse, click on the arrows and start to kind of move them to the right spot uh, and tell us what do you think are the most important ones? So just to give you a sense for what we're thinking of, production capacity, obviously, if you're we're talking about gigawatt hours, you better have production to that level. The track record of the company, right? So how important is that? Uh, how important is having a differentiated performance? Uh, are you looking to diversify with the existing performance or do you feel like it's important to go after suppliers who have something a little bit new? And last one is you, know, you might be worried about warranty, right? In, in which case, what kind of financial reserves do you think this company needs to have before you feel like uh, you will be comfortable kind of doing something with them? That's the question we're asking. This is great, keep it coming. It looks like things are slightly changing, which is completely okay. Well, it looks like, you know, people are gravitating towards production capacity, very appropriate. Um, looks like the track record of the company is important. It's interesting that the financial reserves are not that important. Uh, you know, I know I was talking to somebody or emailing somebody over the, over the weekend on this topic. And that is very interesting that uh, it ended up being the fourth on this list. Uh, it's actually great news if you're a small company uh, it's certainly the track record is important for the company, but certainly the fact that uh, you might be running lean might be okay. So, and the fact that differentiated performance doesn't show up is, is, is interesting, I think. But it's great that people are sort of uh, viewing production capacity as being one of the most critical things. So, uh, in the interest of continuing to get more answers, I'm going to suggest that uh, we move to, I'm kind of thinking we should go to question number seven. Uh, because it's an important question for, uh, so just to give you a sense, right, a majority of the people that signed up for our presentations are battery manufacturers, and we know that our OEMs are a part of this call. And for you guys, the question we wanted to ask you again, in our Hemingway folks, five words or less, what is the rate limiting step for you to qualify a new supplier, right? So in the previous one, you told us production capacity is important, but what is it that you worry about in terms of rate limiting step, right? As, you know, I, we gave an example, but don't, you know, feel free to Tell us what you are really worried about. The example is just to get you to get your juices thinking. If the answer is the example, that's that's fine too. So yeah, please. Uh, I see a lot of wonderful stuff coming in. Historical performance, that's great. Quality standards, current efficiency. Somebody says that's that's great. Uh, geopolitical location, that's interesting. Uh, quality and capacity. Interesting. I see one on carbon footprint. That's fascinating. That's that's great to hear. Frankly. Yeah, again, I want to repeat the question, right? We're asking, what is the rate limiting step? So, you know, some of the answers coming in seem to be more of, uh, why would you choose a new supplier? But again, we're asking, what is the rate limiting step in choosing one? So as an example, you might be saying, hey, your quality control, the one I just see there, may not be where it needs to be. You have to be ITAR certified before we touch you, right? So that's the kind of answer we're looking for. So this is great. Keep it coming. This is fantastic. I see a lot of questions coming in that are very pertinent to, to this. So let's give it a minute. Contracting, material yeah. validation, yep. Demonstration of growth, yeah, that's interesting. That's an interesting comment, engineering research shortage. I don't know if that speaks to workforce. So if that is what you're speaking to, keep that in mind. They're gonna be asking you about workforce, which I think is a significant issue as we've heard from multiple people. So. We are looking for you to tell us more about your challenges in the topic. A cultural difference is an interesting one.
This is great, guys. Keep it coming. We really appreciate this is a wealth of information again coming in this topic. So. Especially as we look to build out our infrastructure, uh, we have to think hard about the fact that there'll be new companies, new ways of doing things, a new way to extract lithium. And you know, if there's a company like that, you know, what's going to limit you is something you have to think about. There's a next question that's going to be of equal importance. So the easy one, we're going to sort of mix it up a little bit and make it a little easy for the next two. But let's give this another, I would say, 30 seconds before we jump to the next question, Bethany, if that's okay. This is great. This is fantastic information. All right, I'm going to suggest in the interest of kind of continuing, let's go to the next question. We're going to slowly move towards recycling. But the first thing we're going to do is we're going to ask you a quick question, which is, if you have a new supplier where they're starting from, say, a virgin material, a new source of lithium or a new cathode chemistry, how long does it take you to qualify that particular material? And we're being a little facetious in the first one, one to two months. If that's the answer you're going to give us, then we want to talk to you because we want to know what your process is. But the other questions are meant to be a little bit more of the, you know, let's see, um, you know, what exactly is the, how long it takes you guys to do that. And uh, as we go to the, uh, let's wait for a minute on this question, and then we're going to slowly walk into more of the recycling side of the, of the picture. So hence this question being an important one, because the, just to prelude, the next question we're going to ask you is, how long is it going to take you if it's a recycling material? So keep that in mind as you answer this question. So here it looks like things seem to be somewhere between the six to 12 and one to two, with a few people saying, well, longer than I care to admit. The 2% of the people saying it's one to two months. Uh, I don't know, I don't know if, uh, that's an interesting comment there. But uh, as with most things, people tend to gravitate to the middle, uh, six to 12, one to two years. It's a long time if it's two years, obviously, in some cases uh, for us to do things. And again, keep in the back of your mind, if somebody now shows up saying, I have a recycled material, say I've got uh, a cobalt coming in from a recycled material, or even something a little bit higher than just the raw metal. Uh, what does it mean for you if somebody says, I've got a recycled cathode that I that was able to get out of a, of a full cell using, say, direct recycling or something like that? How long will it take you? So let's pause for a second here. And it looks like we are settling in the six to 12, one to two, with a few people saying it's longer than they would care to admit. Um, so this is fantastic, thank you. That is now go to question nine, which is the exact same kind of question, except now you're gonna worry about recycle material. So imagine you're gonna be in the recycle side of the picture, how long would it take? And I see a few people, I don't know if you're being, uh, uh, so I could see the one to two years sort of popping up as being a big number. Uh, last time you will remember we were seeing equal six to 12, one to two, with a few people saying it's longer than they would care to admit. It's fascinating that uh, the one to two seems to be increasing. So yeah, keep that going. Let's give it a, you know, a minute or so, uh, so that we can start to get to that stage. We have 10 more minutes to go in the session and we have a few more questions we wanna cover. So, uh, so, but I do wanna wait for you guys to finish answering so that you all have a chance to sort of do this. Is, this is again, very important information for us as we move to the future. This is great. Uh, again, you know, it looks like there is a little bit longer, which is completely appropriate. Maybe the word little bit is not appropriate considering the fact that we're going from six months to two years in the case of uh, those two bars. Uh, but I, I think it's appropriate in the sense that we are still struggling a bit with recycled materials, trying to understand what might be coming, what kind of impurities might be coming with it. Certainly a challenge even for virgin materials in some cases, but thank you. This is extremely helpful. Um, let us now go to question 10, where we're gonna have an open ended question now. And again, we'll be in recycling. And the question we're gonna ask you is, again, Hemingway folks, what inhibits you from using recycled materials in a manufacturing line? For example, you might say it's batch to batch variations. That is really a problem that I'm facing, or there could be something else. So again, uh, this is an open-ended question. Availability, that's a, that's a great answer. The fact that we don't have enough of these recycled materials coming on board. Reduce properties, that's fascinating. I mean, I do wonder if that's, you know, that is a fundamental thing that we have to think about in the recycling world. I think, how do we get to the quality that, I mean, the properties that look like they're you know, sort of um, you know, coming from virgin feed. Uh, variation, yeah, and that's one thing that we've heard multiple times is a big issue. Yeah, no history, that's that's a fantastic comment, right? Uh, it's a brand new recycling process. We don't quite know if that's gonna work. 
And so, yeah, we are almost at the point where they need to be breaking. So let's finish this question quickly. And then we have one more question we'll quickly address as we go into the break, uh, which is an important one that I thought it's uh, we should address. So as we're waiting for this question to kind of fill out, I want to see if, uh, for, just to tee up Bethany, uh, we would like you to, uh, next thing I was thinking, we should jump to question 12 and give it just a minute in question 12. So we'll, we'll hang on this question for 30 seconds and then we'll jump to question 12 after this. So let's wait for 30 seconds. This is fantastic information, folks. We really appreciate it. Um, All right, thank you. This is fantastic. In the interest of moving, let us go to question 12, Bethany, if that's okay with you. And folks, you might see things. Yep, that's fantastic. So uh, last question. I'm going to give you all a minute to do this. If there is one thing you would like to tell our government friends that they ought to be doing so that you as a US company can compete with all the dominant players that are out there, what would that be? Again, five words or less, what is that one thing that you think is extremely important? Um, you know, again, again, Move fast is fantastic. That, that's great. Uh, you know, you've already heard the urgency in the, in the two presentations from Michael and Dave. Uh, this is certainly an important topic. Subsidies, I guess, is what you're thinking of. The streamline per permitting, yeah, that's fantastic. Regulations, yep, relaxed mining regulations. Uh, we really want to understand more of those things, guys, as we go into the sort of the afternoon sessions. But, and there are going to be presentations that you'll be hearing from industry on the sort of the raw material and refining side of things. Let's keep this in mind. Uh, I see people typing in the chat window. Uh, if you are not able to get to uh, Poly V, that's okay. Uh, but if you can, that'll be great. Avoid monopoly, well, please, I guess. Education for batteries, yeah, you know, workforce is crucial. This rapid processing. This is really fantastic, guys. Uh, I'm gonna let this hang for another 30 seconds. Uh, you know, we are actually officially in a break at this moment. So um, I will sort of tell you and I'll leave the question on if that's okay with you all. Uh, so we are actually gonna move towards these breakout sessions. Uh, we're going to do that in exactly seven minutes when we're going to come back and start to move to these breakout sessions. Um, you know, when we go to the breakout sessions, what we're going to have is uh, one of my colleagues from the National Renewable Energy Lab, Tony Burrell, who many of you probably know, is going to be the one moderating the session. Uh, you know, so you know, at, at exactly two, he will come on, and uh, what we will do is we will start. Uh, he will give you a few comments, and then we'll sort of set up for the afternoon session where we'll have the uh, different videos that were submitted by industries focused on the first three uh, AOIs that uh, will be played. This is one on uh, sort of the, uh, if you go back to the NOI and the chart that Dave Howell showed, you will see the area of interest and those are the first three we would do. And then my other colleague from the National Lab System from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, my former home, uh, Noel Bakhtian will, take, uh, will sort of uh, finish off the second part, uh, AOI three, four, and five. So uh, for those of you who want to break, please break. Uh, this has been fantastic. Uh, the information that's coming in for all of these questions have been great. Uh, so we will take all of this information. It's going to be extremely valuable for us as we plan into the future, uh, as we start thinking hard about where we want to take a light bridge, but also for our friends from the Department of Energy. So for those who want to keep the answers going, please keep it. We'll keep this on for maybe in the order of three to you know, maybe 30 seconds. And then uh, Bethany, I suspect, will want to sort of move to some of the other slides that we want to just show you in terms of information. So thank you, folks. For those of you who want to break, please, this is the time for a break. Uh, try to come back in six minutes when we go to the next session. Thank you, folks. Uh, again, uh, join us again in five minutes now at two o'clock and we will get into the industry presentations. I'm seeing some comments, uh, so we're looking at it now. This is great for those of you who qualified things, this is exactly what you should be doing. Uh, we will take all those comments into consideration.
Tony, I think you can start if you want to. Perfect. I, that's why I put everything on. Um, welcome, everybody, and I um, hope everybody's having an exciting meeting. This is one of those, um, you know, key issues for me in, in the way we think about batteries. So I'm a researcher at the National Renewable Energy. My name is Tony Burrell. And um, obviously, as Venkat said, you know, this is the most exciting in time in batteries because we're no longer, how do we get them into the marketplace? It's like, how do we enable them in the marketplace? And I think that's a huge change in the way we think about things. Uh, it's my pleasure to talk about two, the first two AOIs. Um, the first one is on cathode production, the, the you know, positive electrode. This is focusing mostly on resources like cobalt, nickel, manganese, lithium, and other materials that, that activate that positive electrode in these systems. And they, this is the piece of, um, you know, the, the system that gets the most attention. And generally, uh, when I get asked questions like, what do I worry about in batteries? Where do I go? This is the thing that keeps me up at night. This piece we're talking about, we, we know how to make batteries, we can do this. What if we don't have access to the materials that are gonna enable us to do it? We've all seen in the last you know, couple of years, not only political disruption, but supply chain disruption from things we couldn't control, things out of our control. And so this issue of how do we maintain our feedstock and control this resource for the United States is, is sort of at the core of everything we do. It's a little more complicated than that, of course, because as Venkat mentioned, we're not the world's resource for many materials. We have nickel. We don't have the resources that Australia, for example, or Canada does, but we do actually have access to nickel. So what are the best ways to extract that, to develop it and take it forward? But we have to do that sustainably. We can't just strip mine the areas that, are, that we have access to. We have to think about what the long-term um, approaches to that are and you know, where we're going to do it. Obviously, mines tend to be in areas that are not heavily populated, but those populations that are around them can benefit significantly for the, from the enhanced uh, production and from the, the, the conversion of those minerals to materials for feedstocks. But those communities can't be disadvantaged by it. They should be enhanced. We want them to get better. We want that this, these uh, resources to be useful for them. But there's another piece to that, and that's unfortunately thinking about who's going to do that. What's the, do we have the workforce available? What are the issues that we need to address to enable this across the whole chain? Not just I need nickel, but how do I get the nickel? How do I refine the nickel? And how do I do that in a way that's environmentally and socially responsible for the areas that that's going on? We also want to accelerate this. So these are all the things I think about. We want to accelerate it, but we need to do it in a sustainable and responsible way. So figuring out how to do a more aggressive permitting may be something that we need to do, but we can't be just doing that without any regulation. So we've got a couple of presentations, if we move to the next slide, um, that are going to talk about different approaches to this that cover this supply chain issue. And I'll pass it on to the um, presenters. Hello, my name is Austin Devaney, and I'm with Piedmont Lithium. Piedmont Lithium is developing a one-of-a-kind integrated lithium business focused on supporting the development of an electric vehicle supply chain located wholly within North America. The centerpiece of our operations, our Carolina Lithium Project, is located in the historic Carolina 10 spodumene belt of North Carolina, just west of Charlotte, which is one of the largest and richest resources in the world. Our plans are to construct a fully integrated campus encompassing extraction, the production of spodumene concentrate, and the refining of that concentrate into 30,000 tons per year of battery grade lithium hydroxide, all on our 3,500 acre site. The unique geology, geography, and proximity of our resources, production operations, and customer base will allow us to deliver valuable continuity of supply of a high quality lithium hydroxide from spodumene concentrate, which is preferred by most EV manufacturers. We also recognize that as the world gears up for the ever increasing popularity and promise of electric vehicles, the importance of the raw materials required to make this promise a reality increases as well. Piedmont has taken this opportunity 
to expand our footprint and partner with other resources to supply additional manufacturing capacity that would be located in the United States. These combined operations create the potential for us to increase our lithium hydroxide production to 60,000 tons per year, which would make us the largest supplier in North America and one of the largest in the world. We are a company focused on enabling the transition to a net zero world and the creation of a clean energy economy in America. We have a responsibility to be thoughtful stewards of our planet, our environment, and the communities where we operate. Doing our work in the most environmentally responsible way possible is core to our operating philosophy because we understand that what we produce is directly related to positively impacting the sustainability of our planet and the quality of life in the communities where we operate. For us, that means designing in sustainability from day one whether that is the use of an on-site solar farm to power our operations, the latest hydroxide processing technology that greatly reduces emissions, or the use of covered electrical conveyor systems to eliminate trucks, which in turn minimizes our impact to the surrounding community. Our goal is to be the most sustainable provider of lithium hydroxide in the world. Thank you for listening. Good afternoon. I'm Kristen Hanksebeck, Director of Business Development for the Metals Company, and I'd like to thank LiveBridge for the opportunity to provide our feedback. The Metals Company is an explorer of the world's largest reserve of battery metals, polymetallic nodules. Our value is driven both by secured exploration contracts for mineral assets, as well as processing capability, addressing areas of interest one and five for this funding opportunity. Two of our three exploration contract areas are estimated to contain enough in-situ nickel, cobalt, copper, and manganese to fully electrify the U.S. passenger fleet. Our first project, Nori D, is ranked the largest undeveloped nickel project on the planet. At the start of the month, using a valuation model prepared by AMC, Nori D alone had an NPV of $17 billion. The first stage of our pilot processing program conducted at facilities in Pennsylvania and Ontario has successfully converted 75 tons of nodules to a nickel copper cobalt intermediate. The refining phase to make our final products, nickel and cobalt sulfate, copper cathode and manganese silicate is currently underway. The natural characteristics of nodules combined with our customized process flow sheet eliminates the generation of toxic waste and achieves near zero solid waste. We plan to site a U.S. plant in proximity to reliable renewable power and a skilled American workforce as the facility is estimated to require almost 1,200 good paying clean energy jobs. Using this resource and our process, TMC can solve both the cathode raw material and production capacity challenges the U.S. faces today, and we can do this without the need to mine more U.S. land. Our operation can consolidate a 50,000 mile long supply chain controlled by China to a simple 1,500 miles. Our products can feed domestic cathode manufacturing, filling the gap for raw materials that may otherwise cause battery and EV plants to idle as they come online, along with the labor force that supports them. Moreover, we believe we can accomplish this at a fraction of the environmental and social costs that plague battery supply chains today. Drastic reductions in carbon emissions, water usage, waste generation, and without further deforestation or the use of child labor to mine critical metals. While R&D and pilot scale work are well funded by U.S. grant programs, critical development work to enable commercial operations is not well supported. Scoping studies, pre and final feasibility studies for metallurgical facilities are capital intensive, each stage costing several millions of dollars. Given cathode metal processing is concentrated in Asia, particularly where Chinese government has significantly invested in upstream producers, promising new Western suppliers using their own funds for both exploration and feasibility work are at a disadvantage. Thus, the infrastructure bill funding for areas one and five would be well put towards these development activities. I'd like to thank you for your time and consideration. Hi everyone, this is Shane Thompson, the president of Retrieve Technologies. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Retrieve's um, experience in the field of battery recycling and to also talk about where we're going to go um, going forward. So Retrieve is the oldest and largest lithium ion recycler in North America. Um, we've been recycling lithium ion batteries for about 20 years now. 
And so we're very well positioned to leverage that experience to continue with the recycling of the lithium ion batteries. But what we would also like to do is kind of be the complete service offering for customers. And that includes um, two functions of the new business. Um, and that is uh, the ability through our facility in Brea, California to warehouse, store, and test new batteries for the OEMs. Um, this is very helpful in supporting any kind of recall or, or warranty work. Um, and we have experience in doing that. Once the batteries come back, we've got a, a testing uh, process that we're expanding to determine which batteries, you know, and do this in a rapid way, but determine which batteries are good for um, a potential second life application and which batteries have to go for material recovery or recycling. Um, and then from that point, um, those batteries that do go for recycling, we've mapped out uh, an extensive pathway to take what's currently produced, which is called black mass, which is the portions of the battery, the, the, the nickel, cobalt, and copper. So the good side to that is that those elements are being recycled and put back into um, the economy. The downside is, is they're not making their way back to the battery supply chain. We plan on addressing that by getting them back into the supply chain by extracting more of the materials, including the lithium and the anode through uh, a hydrometallurgical process that um, we'll be implementing this year. Um, and then from there, we've got a joint development agreement with 6K Energy to make new cathode. So ultimately we'll be supplying um, cathode back to the battery supply chain for domestic production of batteries here in North America. And as I mentioned, we are committed to Second Life. Um, we see the batteries as having significantly more value when you use them as an energy storage device. So batteries that are coming out of automotive applications still have good energy storage potential. So we're excited uh, to be uh, the complete service provider for companies looking to recycle or reuse their batteries going forward. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to the Bridging the Gap workshop. Mimocord thanks the Department of Energy for this opportunity to present. Let's start with a bit about who we are. Mimocord is a global materials technology and recycling group. We are known for three main things. First, we are one of the global leaders in automotive emission control catalysts and have been a tier supplier to the automotive industry for more than three decades. Second, we are a leading global supplier of rechargeable battery materials for electric vehicles and portable electronics. And third, Umicore is the world's leading recycler of complex waste streams. We recycle the end-of-life catalysts and battery materials we make, as well as other complex materials. Umicore is a global leader in producing cathode active materials, a key component influencing the performance and cost of lithium-ion batteries. We started in this market over 20 years ago and now have eight production sites worldwide. This year, Umicore will produce enough cathode material to power 1 million vehicles. Umicore has a global battery production footprint with cathode manufacturing in Korea, China, and soon in Poland. Our raw material refining and precursor production facilities make Umicore unique. We can supply our customers with cathode material that is completely independent of China. Umicore is also evaluating growing our operations into North America in order to be closer to our customers. Umicore has built Europe's first cathode material production in Nisa, Poland, and commercial scale production will start in mid-2022. This site is fueled by 100% wind energy, and any future expansion across the globe will also need to be powered by green electricity. Recycling end-of-life batteries is one way to help meet the rapidly growing demand for sustainably sourced raw materials. Umicore's unique processes allow us to recycle batteries in the most sustainable way. We recover lithium, cobalt, nickel, copper, and other metals from production scrap and end-of-life batteries. Umicore is active throughout the battery materials supply chain and we ensure strict sustainability and ethical sourcing requirements for all our materials. Umicore's businesses also provide that end-of-life batteries are recycled and their contents returned to the supply chain. From cathode production to battery recycling, Umicore closes the loop from mine to wheel, which is crucial to the creation of a circular economy for batteries. 
Thank you for your time, and if you have any questions, please reach out to Rob Prevett or Casey Westhoff using the coordinates on your screen. South 32 is a global mining and metals company, and our purpose is to make a difference by developing natural resources, improving people's lives now and for generations to come. Our most progressed project in North America is the Hermosa Project in southern Arizona. Despite its surprisingly small footprint, Hermosa contains the world's second largest undeveloped zinc resource and the potential for first U.S. production of battery-grade manganese. Battery-grade manganese is a critical input for the production of NMC cathode active material, but securing the manganese supply chain has been a lower priority in the U.S. relative to nickel and cobalt due to its lower cost. Now, automobile OEMs are increasingly planning high manganese-containing chemistries into their future cathode mix, but global battery-grade manganese production is geographically concentrated. Zero is mined or processed in the U.S. today. Accessible from our privately owned land, the Clark Deposit, one of two deposits at Hermosa, measures at about 55 million metric tons, averaging more than 9% manganese and more than 2% zinc. We've already confirmed a technically viable flow sheet to produce a battery-grade manganese product. So let's talk sustainable development. Our approach focuses on five interconnected pillars that are material to our business and stakeholders and which support the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Hermosa is being designed as a new standard for mining projects and our first carbon neutral mining operation to be fully powered by renewable energy and using electric fleets. Hermosa is located in one of the most economically undiversified counties in Arizona, one hungry for better paying skilled jobs like those created by mining. It has anomalous pockets of wealth in the small towns most proximal to Hermosa, but in the broader county, which is about 83% Latino, nearly 25% live below the poverty line. Hermosa would significantly boost the tax base, help close the racial wealth gap, and create generational lift. Local hiring is a priority for us, and we're laying groundwork with the region's secondary and post-secondary institutions for workforce development through training and education. Hermosa doesn't closely neighbor any tribes and isn't yet in the federal permitting process, but we're proactively engaging with 14 tribes in Arizona, New Mexico, and Oklahoma, and have voluntarily conducted cultural resource surveys across our private lands and all our mining claims in the accompaniment of tribal monitors. We're committed to continuing respectful, proactive engagements with tribes that may have a historic affiliation to the land around our project. Partnering with all of our local communities is a high priority, so we've established a donor-advised community fund that provides grants to local nonprofits with a focus on priorities identified by the community. We also have a third-party facilitated community advisory panel that advises on aspects of our project that have the potential to impact the community. South 32's Hermosa project is one of the most advanced battery-grade manganese projects in the United States, and our preferred development pathway will be selected later this year. I'm Bob Backrack, co-founder and senior vice president of eJewel Incorporated. eJewel is a California company with world headquarters in R&D Center in Fremont, California. The pilot facility with 200 metric ton capabilities in Sinchu, Taiwan, and the first uh, 1,500 metric ton production plant is in China. Today I am submitting comment for Area 1, advocating investment and co-locating lithium ion battery and unyielded cathode active material recycling with U.S. plants for high volume lithium ion cathode active material production as part of the proposed FOA 2678 in support of the bipartisan infrastructure law, materials processing and battery manufacturing funding. EJUL has developed disruptive scalable synthesis process flow for high volume manufacturing of lithium ion cathode active material the EGL process flow goes directly from solution of all the chemical components. The EGL process is particularly suited to incorporating dopants directly into the solution, which are essential to achieving high energy, low to no cobalt compositions. The EGL process flow is based on proprietary equipment and chemistry developed in the United States, which produces high performance, price competitive cathode active material. The high throughput unit equipment module is compact, energy and water efficient, and configured for zero emission. Because e joule process flow goes directly from solution to powder, an e joule plant can directly use the component solution from a co-located recycling pill. 
An example is the BASF Schwarzside CAM plant site, which includes recycling. BASF ships PCAM from its plant in Finland, 1,200 miles to Schwarzside, uh, and the plant is also set up to recycle unyielded cathode powder as well as recycle lithium ion batteries. The BASF has posted YouTube videos of the construction progress. EJUAL has done a conceptual design study of a 50,000 metric ton camp plant which could be built in any suitable location in the United States with joint venture or DOE teaming partners. EJUAL strongly advocates DOE including funding for CAM production as part of the FOA 2678. CAM production is essential to establishing the lithium ion battery supply chain. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to uh, make these comments and uh, look forward to uh, the DOE uh, issuing FOA 2678. Oh, I can't. Oh, so, um, so quick technical note for everybody in this um, who's listening: the Q and A is broken for some reason. Welcome to um, you know online technology. Nothing works perfectly all the time. So we're asking that people switch to the chat, and it's open to everybody. Please make sure when you are in the chat that you use the um, you know send to everybody option rather than to individuals um, and. And please feel free to reach directly out in the chat to the, the companies that are were covered in AOI 1 and are going to be covered in AI, AOI 2. So this is about natural feedstocks and places that you get the materials. So the last section talked about cathode materials, which tend to get all the focus um, in the media, cobalt, lithium, nickel as we go forward but there's a critical piece to batteries in that they need two sides they need a positive electrode and a negative electrode graphite believe it or not while underrepresented in the media is one of those critical material systems that we don't have complete control over and so again all of those resourcing issues that we talked about with cathodes fall into this how do we get it how do we process it how do we get the workforce to develop it how do we get you know accelerated production and and uh, deployment of this. So this is something where, again, we need to think about this from a holistic point of view. And then if we go to the next slide, these companies are going to talk about approaches to that. And please take it away. Hi, I'm Zachary Combs, the R&D Director for Energy Systems at Fearless Carbon. Fearless Carbon is one of the world's leading manufacturers of carbon black with more than 150 years of production experience and an annual carbon black capacity exceeding 2 million metric tons. We produce more than 100 unique grades for different applications at our 16 manufacturing sites around the world. That includes two manufacturing sites in the US, as well as our global technology and business headquarters, which is located outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Fearless Carbon has recently made a net zero by 2050 announcement which is a first for the carbon black industry. In the energy storage market, we have an emerging material strategy, which is focused on developing a full carbon portfolio, including both natural and synthetic graphite, as well as our existing carbon black conductive additives. We can support this industry with our existing global sales and tech service footprint, as well as synergistic product integration and feedstock security provided by our sister Aditya Birla Group companies. Fearless Carbon's full carbon portfolio provides unique solutions for both conductive additives as well as anode active materials. ConductX I-14 is the flagship carbon black conductive additive product designed specifically for the lithium ion market and has shown improved performance, including higher solids loading, as well as high rate and high voltage performance. The second product line is a carbon black carbon nanotube hybrid system, which provides the dispersion characteristics of a carbon black with the high conductivity and low loading characteristics of a carbon nanotube. And lastly, and probably most importantly for growth into the energy storage market, is our development of synthetic and natural graphites as anode active materials using a new to the world process. 
To support LiveBridge, Bureau of Carbon has identified some key U.S. market growth challenges. These include access to capital and equipment, particularly for the value-added graphite processing steps. Um, this also includes raw material manufacturing knowledge, uh, having realistic scale-up plans for production, and including a skilled workforce to support this production. And in the U.S., this all must be done with an environmentally sustainable process that may include something very different than what's used today uh, to manufacture graphite around the world. Baylor Carbon offers some distinct advantages for these challenges, including existing energy positive manufacturing assets in the U.S. It could provide potential co-location and rapid scale up for graphite manufacturing. We've also developed a new to the world graphite manufacturing process which is targeted to lower CO2 emissions and high yield. We can also leverage existing certifications and a long history of supply to the automotive industry for accelerated approvals. Thank you for your time, and please reach out if you have any questions regarding Bureau of Carbon's energy systems product portfolio and growth strategy. I'm Chad Potter, President and CEO of Westwater Resources. I'm here at our site just outside of Kellerton in Coosa County, Alabama. We're building our first of its kind graphite processing plant that will produce refined battery grade graphite for electric vehicles and many other commonly used products. Our graphite refining plant, we use a proprietary and thoroughly tested process that we develop that is both environmentally responsible and sustainable. None of the raw materials we use will come from China. In beginning of 2028, we intend to source our raw graphite to feed our refining plant just miles away from here in the deposit-rich Alabama graphite belt. With our plant and future mining operations, we'll be investing more than 700 million in central Alabama, creating over 100 good-paying jobs and providing a boost to this rural area's economy. Most of the world's graphite comes from China. Westwater plans to be a major U.S. supplier of battery-grade graphite products. During 2021, we completed our pilot processing program and a definitive feasibility study acquired a site for constructing our commercial grade graphite processing facility and purchased two buildings for the use of administrative offices, laboratories, training, and warehousing space. With the acquisition in 2018 of mineral rights for more than 40,000 acres in the Alabama graphite belt, Westwater is uniquely positioned with a U.S.-based graphite resource. Previous exploration work indicates natural flake graphite in quantities that likely exceed 1.9 million tons. That's an estimated 30-year supply Development and permitting of the Coosa deposit is planned over the next few years, with mining anticipated to start in 2028. In the meantime, a source of natural flake graphite concentrate, other than from China, has been secured. Without the use of hydrofluoric acid, our unique purification process is not only environmentally sustainable, it's also safe for workers and produces an extremely pure product that has the potential to increase the performance of all battery types. We took great care in locating an ideal site for the construction and operation of a commercial scale facility to produce our graphite products. We're appreciative of the support we have received in Alabama, from the governor and her administrative and legislative leaders to local county and city officials. And we're proud to bring jobs and hundreds of millions of dollars in investment to this racially diverse area. Our core values call for continuous improvement in safety, cost management, and integrity. As you can see, our CUSA graphite project easily meets the intent and requirements for investment by the DOE under the bipartisan infrastructure law. Upon completion, our project will be the only fully integrated graphite production facility in the U.S. We're providing a homegrown source for graphite. We're investing in American manufacturing and in American workers. And we're doing it all right here in the United States of America. Hi, my name is Daniel Higgs and I'm here with Forge Nano to talk to you today about how we are a US manufacturer of equipment for nano coating of battery materials. My colleague will be talking separately about how we are also a US battery cell producer. Our investors include LG Chem, Air Liquide, VW, Sumitomo Corporation of Americas, and Mitsui Kinzaku. So let's dive straight in. We have a technology that can replace pitch coating Pitch coating is currently used to make graphite anodes stable enough to withstand the harsh environments of a lithium-ion battery. However, pitch coating is expensive, it's dirty, and it's not environmentally friendly. We have developed a high-throughput, one-step continuous process using high-purity chemical sources 
to produce a lower cost, higher performance, and lower environmentally impactful technology. Our technology is currently at TRL 9 um, for our generation one, and generation two is shortly behind that at TRL 7. This technology has been invested in by and validated by the US Department of Energy through their various subgroups listed on this slide. So our plan for US manufacturing of anode graphite powder includes partnering with various graphite production facilities. Um, with them, we are investing over half a billion dollars into graphite mining, graphite refining, uh, graphite purification and coating as well. We provide the coating equipment, which can process 4,000 metric tons of graphite anode powder per year, and that equipment is made in Colorado. We have a very high throughput nano coating technology, and that technology lowers the cost and the environmental impact of the graphite production while improving the battery performance. We are requesting that the US government um, speeds up permits for natural graphite mines, uh, coordinates with the Canadian government to enable easy flow of natural graphite powder from Canada to the USA for processing, and also to continue to support green technologies. We also request that workforce investments are made in various engineering fields, as well as solid state chemistry, mining material science, and battery manufacturing. Forge Nano is following the executive orders 13985, 13990, and 14008, and working closely with Washington to support a comprehensive approach to advancing equity for all. Specifically, we're targeting partners in underserved communities and expanding our own climate tackling technology in Colorado to provide jobs, training, and support for traditionally disenfranchised and historically self-reliant communities. So with that, I'd like to leave you with a few quotes from our various partners, including the DOE, and please feel free to email me at dhiggs at fortnano.com. Thank you. ACPT was founded with the objective of producing high-value, low-cost, strategic materials using low-value fuel oil as feedstock. Through the use of its patented process, ACPT stands to reduce our nation's dependency on China for our strategic materials by converting this carbon-rich feedstock into the base material for graphite, carbon fiber, carbon-carbon, and other materials that are critical to our national security. The resulting materials sequester the carbon that would otherwise be burned and released into the atmosphere, making this an environmentally friendly way to produce these materials in America. We are a R&D focused company that owns a patented process that takes a low cost petroleum product and converts it into mesophase pitch. ACPT views the development of this uh, the development of our technology, the commercialization of our technology as one step of creating a new industry in the United States, the production of synthetic graphite and other graphitic materials. In the past, container ships burned their petroleum waste. With new guidelines in place, they are no longer able to do this. Refineries are left to look for alternatives to meet their disposal needs. The ACP Technologies process provides a solution by utilizing petroleum byproducts to create mesophase pitch. The ACPT process not only enables the nation to produce the strategic materials it needs, but does so in an economically and environmentally friendly way. Our patented process will lower production costs and it is a sustainable green process that will also eliminate the need for foreign production allowing us to produce and manufacture products and components in the United States. This will enable domestic production sources for several national priorities, like the electric vehicle market, hypersonic flight for the DOD, lightweight vehicles and equipment, as well as reduced signatures of DOD equipment. So with the DOD's focus on electrification and in general industry focus on electrification for vehicles, um, there is a real supply chain problem where most of the critical materials that go into a battery, the rare earth metals and the graphite are sourced from foreign countries. And we are a potential source, a uh, domestic source for a critical material, the graphite that goes into the batteries. Currently, ACPT operates a pilot facility in Hitchens, Kentucky. Uh, our pilot plant uh, has successfully ran its uh, process for 90 hours at a time 
and we are seeking to expand that pilot capability by leveraging our partnerships with uh, the federal agencies that we work with and our industry partners um, to create our first commercial size plant. Thank you for the opportunity to share our insights in the electric vehicle and battery material supply chain. I'm Chris Burns, the CEO and co-founder of Novonics, an advanced battery material and technology company with operations in Chattanooga, Tennessee and Halifax, Nova Scotia. Our mission, to make batteries better through materials that will support longer life and lower cost cells for vehicle and energy storage applications with a strict adherence to environmental and social responsibility. Novonics is the only battery grade synthetic graphite supplier with plans to bring large scale production to North America. We're preparing to invest hundreds of millions of dollars over this decade, beginning with the expansion of our Chattanooga facility in close partnership with the local community to create hundreds to thousands of good paying, clean energy jobs. Public private partnerships like Lybridge are essential to effective policy making and fostering certainty for American business investment which is essential not only for developing new battery technologies, but today, more than ever, critical for scaling manufacturing of current technologies. We cannot do this quickly enough. Investing in the production of synthetic graphite offers the United States the ability to build capacity now to meet the immediate demand for electric vehicle batteries, rather than continuing to rely on importing key materials from foreign countries and primarily China. In the United States, we can produce synthetic graphite using clean sources of power and domestic sources of high-grade precursor to create an end-to-end -end American supply chain for this key battery material, which is the best proven anode technology to deliver high energy density and long-life batteries. Public support for the synthetic graphite industry, such as low-cost debt or loan guarantees, will help drive scale and manufacturing efficiency, which is critical to achieving cost competitiveness with the existing Chinese supply chain. For context, Novonics recently raised capital to support 10,000 tons of synthetic graphite production coming online in 2023. Our competitors in China have companies adding tens or hundreds of thousands of tons of capacity per year with significant state support. Of course, domestic support for EV adoption and manufacturing in the United States must remain a top priority and we applaud the Biden administration's commitment to EV expansion and the foundation laid by the bipartisan infrastructure law. We also applaud the administration's recent step to formally recognize graphite as a critical material of importance for national and economic security. Overall, to develop a robust battery material supply chain at home in the United States, the government must prioritize make it in America across industries, from EVs to defense to battery cells and raw materials. Finally, trade policy must align with our domestic policy goals. An appropriate tool to account for externalities and anti-competitive behaviors that skew free markets and act as a structural bar to industry growth here in the United States. The Biden administration has made clear its commitment to strengthening domestic supply chains and American manufacturing. And at Novonics, we believe this is a bright future and we remain a committed partner to this goal. Greetings. It's a great pleasure to present again to the U.S. Department of Energy about the battery materials manufacturing supply chain. My name is Ian McCallum. I'm the Chief Growth Officer at Amstead Graphite Materials. I'm here to talk about the critical need to expand synthetic graphite anode manufacturing capacity in the U.S. for domestic lithium-ion battery production. We are Amstead Graphite Materials, an experienced manufacturer of synthetic graphite anode products. We're proud to note that Amstead Graphite is North America's only fully integrated synthetic graphite anode manufacturer currently in commercial production, qualified by and shipping to an electric vehicle application. We share headquarters with our parent company in Chicago and operate multiple locations in the US. In addition, and central to this presentation, is an ongoing activity engaged with manufacturing expansion. I'll provide more about that in a minute. First, uh, synthetic graphite and natural graphite are significantly different, yet both are required for lithium ion batteries, particularly for EV applications. China's dominance of over 90% of synthetic graphite anode production and growth is risk to our strategic interests. But on the bright side, accelerating demand suggests much further the room to grow here. And the opportunity is clear. The US must establish synthetic graphite anode manufacturing capacity as fast as possible. 
aims to graphite as assemble the pieces necessary for success. The key topic here is manufacturing capacity. The issue dominates every con customer conversation. Amstead Graphite is already executing on two parallel paths. Number one, the pilot plant. From here, we service existing customers and new smaller US battery makers. We conduct R&D and we continue in progress qualification processes with large battery cell manufacturers and OEMs that's accelerating their path to accepting and confirming the US supply base. Number two, expansion plant. We're already in phase two for selection site uh, of plant number one. We're starting the engineering and equipment specification process and raising capital for multiple facilities. A partnership with DOE and others that we're bringing to the party is critical to accelerating these plans and successfully meeting the national supply chain security objectives of this administration. These themes taken collectively represent our unique market position. First and most important, we are in commercial production and shipping and our product to customers today. We're 100% domestically owned and operated. And our pilot plant operation scale is 5,000 tons of annual capacity for graphitization and about 500 tons of finished product capacity. Soon to be officially announced, we are actively working on multiple expansion plants, each at 30,000 tons capacity. We have over a century of operating and graphite materials science expertise with a team with deep battery knowledge and expertise. Uh, finally, our pilot plant utilizes hydropower and our expansion sites are uniquely targeting sites with clean energy access. Our sites aim at being the anode solution for the North American market. Together, we can secure the domestic supply chain of our electrified future. Thank you, and we look forward to further discussions. The future of energy storage. Innovative materials from Farad Power for next generation batteries and supercapacitors. Our advanced carbon and carbon composites based platform technology eliminates the use of current supply chain constrained materials, including cobalt and nickel. Instead, we utilize renewable biomass based raw materials like sugarcane, bagasse, and corn cob with zero or negative value. Join us as we create an alternative supply chain ecosystem for next generation sustainable battery materials. For Rad Power, advanced carbon technologies for next generation applications. So I just want to um, thank the presenters um, for the last two AOIs. I would also point out that both the presenters for those and all of you have an opportunity to point out to DOE what you see the barriers are and what you'll see limiting progress in this, these areas. Um, with that, however, I'm going to pass over to Noel, who's going to talk about the next AOI. Thank you so much, Tony. And hi, everyone. I'm really excited to join today and be leading the discussion of the areas of interest numbers three, four, and five. Uh, thanks to the organizers for asking us moderators to spend five minutes introducing ourselves before diving into the AOIs. So here goes. I'm Noel Bakhtian. I am the executive director of the Energy Storage Center at the Department of Energy's Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And what drives us every day, uh, as you heard today, is the climate crisis and the potential for energy storage to really enable our nation's just transition to a clean and affordable and a resilient energy future. This is, as you've heard from everyone else, a very exciting time for all of us, especially with this bipartisan infrastructure law and the billions, billions of dollars being allocated for batteries. We also have the DOE's Earthshot on long duration storage and hydrogen. We have creation of LiveRidge, which I'm excited to be on the leadership of in support of NatBat, New York Best and New Energy Nexus. And as you heard from our DOE leadership, the 17 national labs, which represent a $30 billion a year annual investment, are coordinating our resources to support on these national challenges. And each lab has its own flavor. So at Berkeley Lab, we're really proud of being the birthplace of lithium ion electrochemistry in the 1950s. And we established this energy storage center to harness the capabilities and expertise of over 200 of our researchers across the lab who work on energy storage. Everything from our lithium center, Lyric, to our brilliant researchers inventing new battery chemistries like DRX, to our five national user facilities available to you as industry. They're, they're publicly accessible, billion dollar resources. Uh, all the way to our folks pushing the boundaries on the science of manufacturing batteries using artificial intelligence and machine learning, all the way up the value chain 
to our markets and policy teams providing tech assistance to utilities and public utility commissions. So one of the center's primary focus areas is on building out the US domestic battery supply chain ecosystem, very aligned with everything that you've heard today. And in fact, we convened a 2000 person national summit just last week to catalyze new partnerships and new solutions in this space with a focus on doing a double click on the national blueprint for lithium batteries that you heard about earlier uh, from, from Dave and others that came out of FCAB. And that really helps us cross the boundaries between research, between policy and regulation, industry, but also communities so that we can build bridges to fuel our US battery revolution from resource to recharge. I do wanna call out like others have this, these cross-cutting themes of workforce and equity that are so important, an important part of any conversation on energy storage and the solution space. Uh, and in fact, we've actually launched a community of practice at the intersection of energy storage and equity. Uh, so keep an ear out for those themes today and going forward as well. Please be thinking about submitting questions and answers in the chat with those themes in mind as well. And just to close out my quick intro and to quote Secretary of Energy Jennifer Granholm, this is an all hands on deck moment and Berkeley Lab and the other labs are all geared up to support at this epic moment in history. So with that, let's transition to area of interest three, other commercial scale domestic battery materials extraction and processing. So this is everything but the sta standard cathode transition metals, which you heard about from Tony and AOI-1, and everything other than the graphite anodes that we just heard about from Tony and AOI-2. So we're talking about everything else. For example, lithium metal, liquid electrolytes, solid electrolytes, such as rare earth metals like lanthanum, and non-graphitic anodes, which include silicon and inner metallic anodes like germanium, tin, antimony. But the centerpiece here is still lithium. A major thread from the summit last week was that only 2% of the global lithium market comes from the US right now, but we have the opportunity to extract a significant amount of lithium domestically. And given the lithium demand curve that we're all seeing, we need a lot more of it and faster. So this is really an acute challenge. Moreover, we have to think about this. Nationally, we haven't really used our domestic lithium resources for commercial production in a big way. So we need to learn how to do that efficiently, sustainably, cost competitively, and working with our local communities. And like I said, an all hands on deck challenge, including the cats and dogs amongst us uh, and the national labs are standing by to support. In fact, DOE just announced a significant investment via Berkeley Lab to study the lithium resource in Lithium Valley, Imperial Valley in Southern California, and this is in partnership with Berkshire Hathaway in UC Riverside, two of our many partners in Lithium Valley. So let's flip to the next slide. Here are the companies that we're going to be hearing from on this area of interest in no particular order. And don't forget, the industry leaders you're seeing in the videos are in attendance and looking to answer your questions. So please use the chat function to ask your questions or answer questions. Uh, and, and like you've heard, this is all going to be posted online, including the Q&A. So let's get started on the AOI3 videos. Hello, I'm Jonathan Evans, CEO of Lithium Americas. At Lithium Americas, we're optimistic about President Biden's ambitious plan to secure our country's supply chain for electrification, and we share his sense of urgency. I'd like to start by addressing the challenges you set out in your invitation. At Lithium Americas, we believe what works best is partnership, strategic partnerships that support private sector investments in mining, processing, and recycling enterprises, and support long-term sustainability while ramping production of vital battery materials. Supporting these investments will also help close the gaps in current workforce black spots and infrastructure shortfalls. Our Thacker Pass Lithium Project in Nevada is the largest and most advanced anywhere in the United States. We recently received all key state permits in addition to the record of decision from the U.S. Bureau of Land Management last year. Between mining and processing on site, we expect Thacker Pass to ramp production to 80,000 tons a year of battery quality lithium carbonate over its 40 year life cycle. And we're looking forward to commencing construction within the next 12 months. For us at Thacker Pass, closing that gap at the speed of now means training up a skilled workforce that can plan, build, and operate mines and processing plants within the next two years, 
we're already working with local partners to equip local people with the right skills to thrive in the industry. For the rural communities around Thacker Pass, our project is a game changer. In the initial phase, we're planning to provide 300 family wage jobs, and in later phases, that is likely to rise to 500. The payroll impact alone will help to lift this region of Northern Nevada, including the nearby Fort McDermott Native American tribe into a sustainable long-term future for its people. At the same time, we know how important it is to deliver the benefits of the lithium supply chain in a way that minimizes impact to the local environment. We've spent the last 10 years collecting data and undertaking studies to develop a plan that exceeds regulatory requirements while engaging in a transparent collaborative process with the local community. Through a strategic partnership with the federal government, we're poised to make an immediate impact on securing a domestic supply of lithium. And we're on a shared mission with President Biden to make the United States a leader in the fight against climate change. Thank you for your attention. As the electric vehicle battery market grows and the ecosystem evolves, there's an increased demand for high volumes of industrial gases. Industrial gases include nitrogen, oxygen, argon, helium, and other specialty gases. Starting upstream with mining and refining of raw materials like nickel, cobalt, lithium, all the way to battery recycling, industrial gases are required at every step of the value chain. Zooming in specifically on the cathode manufacture, the industrial gas requirement, depending on the scale of the cathode production unit, could range from on-site storage, less than 100 tons per day of oxygen, to on-site oxygen production plants of 200 to 500 tons per day of oxygen. If the U.S. is expected to see a battery demand growth of around 150 gigawatt hour by 2025, this will require a significant scale-up of industrial gas capacity requirements. While such large-scale gas supply is based on mature air separation technology and such large-scale production bases exist currently in the U.S. Gulf Coast, such scale of industrial gas volume is not readily available in locations where the battery ecosystem is evolving. Establishing production and growing the technical workforce know-how in the regions that the battery ecosystem evolves will require considerable investment. In addition, there's a need for the gas supply to be highly reliable and safe and that the delivery of gases meet critical purity specifications as the battery market grows in the U.S. The growth of U.S. manufacturing of the battery supply chain will be an opportunity to expand the industrial gas operation workforce into various parts of the country and develop local economic opportunities as well as well-paid construction and permanent jobs. Air Liquid is leveraging over 100 years of experience in the industrial gas business. In the U.S., we have the capability to support high-volume demands with our extensive pipeline network. In addition, Air Liquid and Air Gas own and operate around 70 air separation units across the country. In accordance with our global sustainability goals, we seek to provide carbon-free industrial gases to our customers in the battery market. The industrial gas infrastructure will be critical in the final quality, stability and safety of processes across the battery ecosystem. We would like to have the support of the U.S. Department of Energy as it ventures to fund the development of the U.S. battery ecosystem and look forward to working together to ensure a sustainable development of the battery market in the U.S. Okay, well that was area of interest three, and now moving on to area of interest four, demonstration projects for domestic separation and production of battery grade materials from unconventional domestic sources. So here we're still talking about how to source materials, but this one is zeroing in on unconventional domestic sources. So when we're going after specific materials or elements in the earth, there's major consideration given to the cost and the challenge of sustainability, and you're at the mercy of the density of the resource and the location. 
The magic of unconventional domestic sources is that whether naturally or through human effort, some of the battery materials that we're seeking can be harvested in new and innovative ways. For instance, at Berkeley Lab, we're working with industry in the Lithium Valley on extracting lithium from geothermal brines. The geothermal power plants in Imperial Valley already bring the lithium rich water up to the surface. So the opportunity is to extract the lithium from these brines that already exist at the surface. So you're gonna hear uh, today from a company, for example, that has been producing boron, boric acid for years and is a, and a byproduct of this process is lithium. It was a waste product and has already been dug up. So you're gonna hear about the valorization of this existing waste stream for the benefit of our domestic battery ecosystem. Similarly, unconventional sources for battery materials can include coal ash and mining drainage ponds. And what really excites me about this whole topic is that we're taking advantage of unconventional sources. And this is essentially moving us closer to a circular economy. So rather than mining primarily for these materials, which is absolutely one of the, the solutions in the space, we can also be taking them from other waste streams, which decreases our impact, sometimes is cheaper, and lets us move away from uh, some of the challenges of foreign imports. So let's flip to the next slide. Here are the companies we'll be hearing from on this area of interest, again, in no particular order. And again, don't forget the industry leaders you're seeing in these videos are in attendance and looking to answer your questions in the chat. Uh, and we'll be posting all of this online. So let's take the videos next. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Lei Pan, and I'm the founder of Nile Meadows. We are supported by Michigan Technological University and the Eagle Mine, owned by the Longding Mining Corporation. Eagle Mine is the only primary nickel mine in the United States. Our mission is to supply refined battery materials from both conventional and unconventional resources. Nile's technology platform is a revolutionary advancement. It is a flexible process, taking various nickel and cobalt resources as a feed. Our pilot skill demonstration is planned for 2023. Nile Meadows' long-term vision is to address the refining problems of battery metals, which is identified as one of the key challenges faced in the electric vehicle supply chain. Currently, the United States produces zero refined nickel and cobalt metal product from either primary ore or secondary resources. In contrast, China produces 70 to 80% of the refined battery component globally. Nile Metals will demonstrate the mass separation and production of the battery grade material from Eagle's mine tailing. To date, Eagle's tailing facility contains 63 million pounds of nickel, 3 million pounds of cobalt, and nearly 20 million pounds of copper. Together, these are sufficient to manufacture nearly 300,000 electric vehicle battery pack using NCA or IMC A11 chemistry. Over 75% of the remaining nickel and cobalt are recoverable using NIOS technology platform. Currently, research, development, and demonstration on production of battery grade material is ongoing. As you all know, new mine permitting, feasibility, and construction can be a lengthy process. Nile Meadows can take mine tailing right now from Eagle's operation, as well as from future nickel operators in the regime with zero mining cost. In addition, Nile's process can convert waste and hazardous material into inert material while extracting valuable battery metals, which will eventually help the permitting of the new nickel and cobalt mining project here in the United States. Nile Meadows is looking for senior executive to join our management teams. Please feel free to reach out to us if you would like to discuss more about this project. Thank you very much for your attention.
Okay, and now on to area of interest five, demonstration projects for domestic battery materials, separation and processing with improved yield and lower cost energy, water usage and emissions. So this AOI is all about efficiency, about thinking about our environmental footprint, about considering the life cycle analysis and techno-economic analyses. This is all an incredibly important piece of the puzzle and something we have a whole team of folks working on at our lab across the other labs due to its importance. So because in the US, we, we have to think about, it's not just about cost. Sometimes that's the case in other countries, but at the end of the day, energy storage is a linchpin in the solution space for climate change and resilience, which means that the solutions that we come up with, we, we have to be um, making sure that these solutions support and don't hurt these end goals when it comes to emissions and water and energy use. And this is often where there's a major touch point with our local communities as well. So let me give a parallel example through the Department of Energy's National Alliance for Water Innovation or NAWI, which is hosted at Berkeley Lab. We're pushing hard on topics like precision separation, removing specific ions from feed waters using membrane based technologies or thermal technologies. And these material separations from non-traditional waters support the need we're talking about here as well. Um, also on a very innovative side, the mining sector itself is moving towards electrification in some cases. There's at least one company that we know about that's pushing for all electric mining such that they can be powered by renewables. I just saw a question in the chat about this, so I'm glad people are thinking about it. And there are so many other opportunities here for innovation from in situ processing to recycling and second life batteries, which you're gonna hear about in this session and others. So let's flip to the next slide. Here are the companies that you're going to be hearing from in this area of interest in no particular order. And don't forget the industry leaders you're going to see are in attendance and looking to answer your questions in the chat. So let's take a look at these videos. While there are large amounts of electric vehicle manufacturing factories going up in the US, very many uh, cell manufacturing plants currently being constructed, there still is really not the quantity of primary battery metal manufacturing facilities being constructed. Those vehicle plants and those cell plants are relying almost entirely on foreign source battery metals to make their products. This means that there really isn't a closed loop within the North American market yet. This open loop really leaves domestic companies vulnerable with regards to the security of their supply chain, to the cost of having to source and pay import tariffs on all of those materials. And it really doesn't give them the necessary visibility on the environmental impact of what really happened in the sourcing of those metals. American Battery Metals is both primary mining company where we're working to extract lithium and other battery metals. And we've also developed an in-house full recycling train for the recycling of lithium ion batteries. It really allows us to both add new primary material to the supply loop and also to take end of life and waste material, recycle it and turn it right back around in that same loop. So currently there are many companies out there who have laboratory scale efforts for recycling lithium ion batteries for the manufacturing of battery metals, but doing work at laboratory scale only goes so far. What the industry is really looking for is someone who can actually make these materials at commercial scale. So for a recycling facility, we have to consider both the large amount of material already in the market with older technologies, plus brand new technologies being made today, plus any changes being made in the future to make each of our recycling facilities future-proof and a wide breadth of type of feedstock that they can take in. One of the big advantages of this design we've come up with is that it has dramatically lower environmental impact compared to other types of lithium manufacturing processes that are proposed. We have far lower consumption of acids and other chemical loadings, far lower generation of waste materials. And during this NEPA review, all that came to the surface and we were excited to get such a great response in our environmental review.
Here Lithium is commercializing a breakthrough lithium metal battery technology and manufacturing process that is clean, sustainable, scalable, and cost effective. Lithium metal is widely acknowledged as the material needed for superior next generation batteries that are safer and higher energy density. Pure Lithium's novel technology eliminates more than 80% of the current manufacturing costs in lithium metal production, which in turn unlocks widespread adoption of lithium metal batteries that cost less than $50 per kilowatt hour. The United States is home to a diverse range of lithium bearing deposits, from hard rock spodumene and oil field brines in the southeast to clays, conventional brines, and geothermal brines in the west. Pure Lithium's technology can take that lithium from the ground and put it into a battery right here in the US, leapfrogging the current Asia-dominated supply chain. Pure Lithium's metal electrodes are elementally pure. Our one-step electrodeposition process creates a clean native interface that's protected from air and moisture, which improves performance and reduces costs. As a woman-owned business, Pure Lithium has embedded working for environmental justice and treating communities as stakeholders into the very fiber of our company. We are uniquely capable of training technicians with high school or technical backgrounds to hold valuable jobs in the battery industry. Pure Lithium's process can be deployed either close to lithium production or in manufacturing hubs. We are an integral part of securing the energy supply chain, and that depends on building the lithium batteries of the future here in the United States. I'm Bob Mullaney, I'm the CEO of ITAP. The key to the battery industry is extending its life as long as you can and putting them in second life applications to live out their life cycle. This is Marshall Kniper, Chief Technology Officer of IT Asset Partners. After investing $12 million into R&D, we have successfully built second life solutions for all lithium batteries in the United States. At ITAP, we use the past to power our future. Lithium batteries can last 10 to 20 years depending on how they're used, but most are discarded within five to seven years. These two mugs represent lithium ion batteries. This mug represents the scrap recycling solution, and this mug represents reuse. This still has value. Now let's look at the scrap recycling solution. Do you see the difference? And if this is LFP, the taxpayer has to pay to get rid of it. Everybody knows the tsunami of EVs is coming to America. The question is, what are we gonna do with the batteries? Electronic waste in our landfills is responsible for 70% of the heavy metals leaching into our water table. Only 17% of e-waste is recycled in America today. But what if there was a better answer? What if there was an innovative solution that could benefit everyone? What if we could retain the value of the lithium batteries? Reduce, reuse, recycle. We are all told this as children, but where's the reuse in America? In 2017, ITAP realized that EV batteries would become the largest single volume of low value hazardous e-waste in the United States. ITAP is actively paying our customers for lithium batteries, including LFP, while processing all EV battery waste domestically and maintaining a zero landfill policy. We are requesting support to expand these Second Life solutions nationwide and automate the process to create true sustainability for EV battery waste within the United States. Reuse makes things affordable. It provides abundance in a world of scarcity. All our products are returned here, made here, and moved out into the market as US-made products. The choice is ours. We can incentivize recyclers to reuse or fund a doomed scrap recycling system. So the message I have for you, the DOE, is if you want to put the time and effort, we're your partner. We've invested in the technology, we understand it, and we know how to do it safely. As you decide how to allocate this funding, we hope you consider reuse as the true sustainable solution, turning our country's lemons into lemonade. Thank you for your time. Hello, 
this is Chris Abram from Hit Nano. We're a small business based in New Jersey, and we want to share with you our battery cathode manufacturing technologies with a view to developing fruitful partnerships to scale up these technologies in the United States. So we began in Princeton University in 2017, and our mission is to develop environmentally friendly manufacturing solutions for high performance energy storage materials for electric vehicles. So we've three relevant patterns on the technologies I'll be talking about. Uh, we receive funding from the Department of Energy and actively collaborate with academic and industry partners in materials, batteries and electric vehicles area. So we are providing solutions for the next generation of cathode manufacturing. So the co-precipitation route is the prevailing cathode production technology and is dominated by countries such as China, Korea and Japan at present. So in this process, metals are processed into metal salts, which is itself an energy intensive process. Sulfate salts are then fed into the co-precipitation reactor, which requires additional chemicals and generates wastewater, which requires energy intensive processing for recovery. So in other words, this is a time consuming, capital intensive and environmentally damaging process that needs to be updated. We have two technologies uh, which are completely different. First, we're working on an aerosol synthesis process. It forms a lithiated active cathode material uh, with low energy and no additional chemicals in a, uh, a rapid process step. Second, we're working on a direct metal oxidation to cathode process. This process completely eliminates the conversion of metals to metal salts, which further reduces the time, the environmental impact and the cost of the cathode material significantly. Turning to the first of these technologies, the aerosol method is very flexible for designing novel materials with precise ion doping. So as shown, we can achieve selective ion precipitation, which forms a concentration gradient structure. This improves the thermal stability and the electrochemical performance of the material. Moreover, this method has a very broad uh, compositional flexibility, is fast and it requires no additional chemicals. In the second method we're working on, direct metal oxidation to cathode. From a manufacturing standpoint, this method is truly single step. It completely eliminates two major steps in co-precipitation by working directly with metals, and it's fully compatible with existing plants, so it makes scale up very straightforward. So we can use this method to produce gradient structure, high performance cobalt free and nickel rich materials. In summary, these are two technologies which have the potential to transform conventional cathode manufacturing and we are looking for partnerships to commercialize these technologies and establish environmentally cathode manufacturing here in the United States. Thank you. Okay, and with that, that completes our areas of interest uh, deep dives for today with industry. So now over to you, Venkat. Thank you so much, Noel. I deeply appreciate the time both you and Tony took to sort of look at these different things. And I'm just noticing that the chat window is ablaze with a lot of different comments and questions and people talking about various things. So please keep that going. That really is fantastic. Uh, you know, there were a couple of questions that people responded to in terms of permitting and also in terms of local engagement of the community. Uh, we want to hear from you. The next session after the break is going to be focused on those aspects. And as you heard from both uh, uh, Michael and from Dave, that is going to be an important part of uh, what we need to think about as we look at the next uh, five to ten years of this growth that we expect to see in the energy storage market. 
There are a few poll questions that I wanted to make sure we cover just because we didn't have time in the morning. So just for people who are coming in new, uh, go to a website, go to this website here, pollev.com slash argon1, so P-O-L-L-E-V.com slash A-R-G-O-N-N-E-1. If you go there, then you will start to see the poll questions. For those of you who are on a phone, again, we recommend that you don't do this on a phone just because it's a much of a, it's a bit of a kludgy device. It doesn't work particularly well, but if you do have to do that, then you can text 22333 with the message argon1, A-R-G-O-N-N-E-1. What we're going to do now is we're going to go to a few different questions that uh, we, we, we did not have a chance to cover in the morning. And we're gonna start off with the first question, which is question number 11. So, uh, so one of the questions that we wanted to ask you guys, and this is sort of an important one, is asking what challenges stop you from expanding production domestically in the order in which you think this is a problem. Now, uh, we've already uh, sort of heard a little bit in the chat window, right? Permitting delays for people who are sort of looking at some of the AOI one, two, three aspects. Uh, people are worried about uh, lack of access to suppliers. If you're sort of higher up or lower down in the supply chain, workforce comes up quite a bit. And so where are you in this? And again, this is a ranking order, which means you hover your mouse on the particular entry. And then you will see an up arrow and a down arrow. And we simply just move them up to whenever you want it to be. So I'm going to give it a second here, only because it takes maybe in the order of 15 seconds to get the order you might be happy with. So let's see if uh, people can log on and participate. Again, it's pollev.com slash argon1 for people who are joining late. Uh, we will be doing a little bit more polling later on in the day today, time permitting, but this is an important area that I wanted to make sure we cover. What challenges stop you from expanding production domestically? And I'm seeing an interesting trend here. We're seeing workforce show up as a trend. Again, please listen to the presentation that's gonna come up after the break. It's, it's gonna be shedding some light on this and use the chat window. Tell us uh, where you see issues in this. Uh, actually, uh, we have a poll question on that, which we may not be able to get to right now, but we'll get to it hopefully in the afternoon in terms of where you see the biggest gaps. But please let us know. I see an important comment in the in the chat that says you should ask public, uh, you should add public resistance. That's an important question. I think uh, NIMBY, or not in my backyard, tends to be an issue oftentimes. So uh, lack of skilled workforce. I'm seeing a lack of access to suppliers. That's interesting. Uh, I'm sort of uh, curious about the fact that finance is third. Um, you know, if I think back 10 years ago when we were going through the last, well, maybe that was more 12, 13 years ago and we had a bit of a clean tech boom, uh, I think the lack of access to finance was cited quite a bit. I remember 10 years ago, right, just because people are worried about how they're going to build these uh, large manufacturing facilities, which cost hundreds of millions of dollars. So it's great to see that problem appears to be slightly lower, but then new problems crop up. So uh, again, I'll give it maybe 30 seconds to make sure that others have a chance to respond if you haven't had a chance to respond. But it looks like we are seeing the order. Workforce is an issue. Lack of suppliers is a second issue. Finance certainly hasn't gone away. Interesting, the permitting delays, environmental regulations and market size are in different parts of this uh, order. But certainly, I mean, market size, I think you know we've all heard that that should not be a big issue at all. Uh, you know, permitting and regulations, uh, I'm surprised that are low, but it could also be just the demographic of the people taking the poll. So I do think those remain challenges we have to think about. So thank you, folks. That's fantastic. I do want to go back to question 12. So if you remember question 12, this is where we said in five words or less, what is the single most important thing the, the U.S. government can do to make it possible for U.S. companies to compete against these dominant uh, players? A lot of you commented, which is great. So don't feel like you have to repeat the comments. But if you have heard things, especially as you're listening to the presentations, we just wanted to give you a chance to uh, sort of finish off the thought because uh, you know I felt like people were still uh, putting in answers and we kind of had to cut you off because of the, of the break. So we just wanted to give you a few minutes now to ensure that you continue to sort of give us your feedback and where you think some of the most important opportunities are. So we see permitting again as something important. So again, a bit of the where you are in the supply chain, I think matters a lot in, in these kinds of questions. Uh, regulation comes up, funding, that's interesting. Put a tariff. That's an interesting thought. Yeah, I mean, some of you might have heard about USMCA. I'm sure you're paying attention to that. So, research and renovation. Yeah, carbon and you know, counting carbon, I think, is going to be very important for us. This partnership with China, that's an interesting. Just incentives to domestic manufacturing. Uh, certainly, I think we are seeing that in the infrastructure and the funding part. We're seeing that. Um, certainly, there's a lot of private capital. Uh, I've been the number of companies that have gone public in the last two years. It's been heartening to see that as a person who's been in the battery community, sort of struggling to see which company is going to make it. So, workforce, that's important. 
it's, it's a quarter of many years, yep. Well, that's a great thing, funding basic science. I mean, as a person who comes from that part of the, the national lab system, that certainly is an important part of what needs to happen to feed the pipeline for the future. So, so body manufacturing, yeah. These are great, so this is fantastic. I know these, some of these are newer than the ones as we saw in the morning, so I'm glad that a few others had an opportunity to sort of come in and weigh in. Is good a national strategy? Yep, uh, we have a strategy in the national blueprint, certainly that's what these kinds of meetings are meant for. Yeah, so consortium of companies like Mantech, and certainly this is part of what Library is trying to accomplish, sort of bring people uh, together and, have a conversation about what needs to get done. Uh, Semitech is an example that we all hear about as a, as a way to do this. This is fantastic, folks. I mean, I see a lot of responses coming in. So. I see adjusting tariffs. Uh, you know, I know there are people in the audience from different parts of the federal government, so I'm sure they're paying attention to these kinds of questions because that's exactly the kind of thing that they are hoping to hear from all of you. It's an interesting comment. From materials manufacturing only, award monopolies. And we saw this, I think, comment in the morning too. Yeah, collaboration across supply chains is probably is very important, right? How do you team up? And we've seen a little bit of that in the, in the private industry, people kind of partnering with battery companies, OEMs, battery companies, and uh, cathode producers all coming together. So that's great. Yeah, the idea of green energy production is interesting. Yeah, certainly, I think as we look to the future, we've got to be careful about uh, how we are going to be doing all the manufacturing and the mining. So, Yeah, protect IP, very important topic. It's certainly something that I think a lot of people are paying attention to very closely. Uh, you know, this certainly is a topic that we all pay attention to in the national lab system because it's you know, bread and butter for us in terms of how we think about innovations so, in addition to paper. So I think we're coming to a logical end as my, one of my friends would say, D and DT appears to be coming to zero. Therefore, I think we should move to the next question, which is question 13. So two more, two questions kind of you know, on sort of the looking at uh, sort of 2030 and asking questions that are beyond the sort of the, you know, some of the chat questions on the lithium ion space. So here we're asking 2030, imagine you're predicting the future again, what percent of US manufacturing capacity will focus on LFP cells? Just to note that today it's kind of trivial. And the beauty of online polling where we don't know who's responding is that you can be completely wrong in your prediction. It's okay, nobody will know. I've been known to publicly predict things that have been wrong. So that's a little embarrassing. You don't have that product. So I see 20 to 40%. That's an interesting number cropping up. I am surprised that some of those 60 to 80% that's suggesting that, you know, these uh, EV markets will move towards the kind of the iron, iron systems where maybe we won't get the full range you might be able to get in an NMC cathode, but, you know, maybe that's okay. As many people have observed, uh, many of us are not going 300 miles every day. So a 40 mile EV oftentimes suffices except for those long distances. So you can see the logic of having LFP being there. So, although I am noticing that the percentage is sort of hovering around 20 to 40% is where people seem to think there's a lot of uh, value based seen LFP cells. And I, I will say that, you know, there are, there's a second market for LFP that uh, seems to be, you know, very interesting, which is the whole stationary storage world. Uh, certainly a great chemistry, you know, one of the, uh, you can't sort of beat the potential uh, where it operates in terms of uh, being able to protect it from side reactions, but potential is what hurts you again when it comes to energy density. So it looks like we are hovering around the 20 to 40% brain. I see a few small changes that certainly uh, equal, I think some number of people think that it's not gonna be as big and some thinking it may be even bigger. So certainly I think uh, we are seeing that LFP, it looks like people believe will play a role. And I would I would want to say an important role looking at the percentages that we're seeing in this chart. And that really is, I think, uh, something that is good to hear. Let us go to question number 14. And we're going to sort of, this is the one where we expand the lens much wider and ask a question. And again, we're predicting the future. Uh, so again, you know, no answers or wrong answers here. When do you think non-lithium based batteries? So this is a question that came up in chat. So what am I on? And let's think wider than electric vehicles, even flow batteries for grid storage. 
When do you think that'll become widespread? And the word widespread is important here, guys. So uh, I know all of you are responding, but you know, uh, look at the scale in which we're talking about things, right? We're talking terawatt hour a year at a production capacity, right? So if you're making a few megawatt hour, well, that's great, but it's not enough. So when, when we use the word widespread, we're thinking tens of gigawatt hour a year yearly production, which means that you know this needs to be at a stage where we built out that factory and it's been qualified and you're thinking, you know, this qualified process is going to be something that people can adopt. And so the question is, how long do you think that will take? And I'm seeing that people think, yeah, this is kind of interesting, right? A lot of more than 10 years, which uh, I could arguably sort of shows the difficulty of going from sort of taking a new technology and getting it up to the scales that we're talking about here. It certainly took us a while to do that in lithium ion batteries. And now we are seeing that sort of accelerate just because we've learned so much. But the question becomes, how long does it take for new technologies to do that? So, I'm seeing that, yeah, I mean, people are hovering around the more than 10 year mark. Uh, that really is fantastic. But I, I'm also glad to see people saying five to 10 years. And that's exciting. I mean, I know companies that are pursuing things that are not in the lithium battery space. And uh, you know, I know companies that have actually moved out of labs and taken IP from labs. And it's really good to see that uh, some of these people hopefully are trying to push hard to try to get these technologies out and make them commercial and get them to production scales. The one nice thing about having a big market is that we certainly have the opportunity to sort of do things like this. So I think this is getting to the stage where we are seeing enough numbers. Uh, you know, the, there's a question in the chat asking how many people are participating in these things. We will find the answer to that. So this is all in the back end. Again, it's I think it's anonymous in terms of who's actually responding to what button, but it certainly uh, gives us in the back end information as to how many people are participating. Uh, we have uh, you know, hundreds of people on the line, so I, I'm, I'm sort of seeing this as a lot of people coming in as we've seen. So, uh, so I'm actually going to call it, I think we have more poll questions, but we are also at a point where we probably ought to take a break just because it's been a sort of a big session where we've had before. So I want to thank Bethany and um, sort of say that, um, you know, one thing we should do is uh, sort of think back on all the things we've heard during this break. So we have a 15 minute break. We're going to reassemble at uh, 245 Central, 345 Eastern time. So we have a 15 minute break now. But when we come back, we're going to talk about three very important aspects, right? Workforce, workforce, that's extremely important. We've heard this from many of you. So we're going to hear a little bit about uh, DOE leadership on this topic. And we're going to hear a little bit about um, the whole concept of environmental justice and equity. And how do you think about this as we develop this industry? And the third thing that we want to touch on is permitting. So you know, use the chat window, think about things that you think are important for you in those three aspects, and let us know. And uh, we will come back at 3.45 Eastern time uh, from the break and sort of listen to it. And we'll have actually Michael Burby is going to be uh, moderating the beginning of that session. We will hear more from them. So thank you all for participating. This is fantastic feedback. We have a 15 minute break.
we will start. I hope everybody had a good break. Uh, I know it's been a bit of a sort of a marathon session of polling and listening to video presentations, but we're now going to go to a very important topic, a topic that I think uh, we need to think about very carefully as we embark on this huge infrastructure build out that we're thinking about. Uh, you know, again, the 2030 targets are, uh, you know, in some sense, uh, really aggressive, but also we are, you know, the market demand is saying that we can do something about it. But as we look at where we are going, we need to think deeply about how are we going to engage the local community. We've already heard a little bit of this um, from some of the speakers from the video presentations. We have to think hard about environmental justice, right? This is a topic that I think is going to be front and center. How do we ensure that the people most affected by climate change get the benefits of the fact that we're transitioning into this, into this new world and don't get left behind? And the third theme that has shown up so many times today and in the past is the whole idea of workforce development. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have a couple of presentations from DOE leadership. The first one is going to be from Bethany Jones, who's a senior advisor for Workforce Office of the Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy in the Department of Energy. She is thinking a lot about this transition from the internal combustion world to the clean energy, battery kind of powered electric vehicle world. What does it mean? What does it mean for jobs? I think that will give us some perspectives as to how we should be thinking about this challenge and how do we ensure that we all are looking at the workforce very carefully and figuring out where we can do the most and how can the government help in sort of getting us there. The second presentation right after that is going to be from Shalanda Baker, uh, who is the, I think the first uh, Deputy Director of Energy Justice in the Office of Economic Impact and Diversity. She's a Secretary Advisor on Equity. This is an important topic and she's gonna tell you a little bit about the concept of energy justice and equity and how that's gonna play an important role. And the, the initiative from the administration called EJ40, Energy Justice 40, and she'll touch up on those two aspects. What we'll do is we'll first hear from Bethany and then from Shalanda. And once we do that, we're gonna have a small round table panel and I'm gonna bring back Tony, Noel, and hopefully Michael. And then we will sort of spend some time, talk a little bit about what we've heard in the breakout sessions and have a discussion. And then we have a couple of polling questions that we wanna to get to uh, so that we can get your perspective on these topics. So, so without further ado, uh, if uh, let's start hearing from Bethany. Hi, I'm Bethany Jones. I'm a senior advisor for jobs and workforce in the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about our workforce development efforts and the EV transition. So first, we know that there are some challenges. The auto industry which will be affected by this transition is a key employer. We know that EVs require about 10% less production labor than internal combustion engine vehicles, so that poses a challenge in terms of job loss. Uh, we also know that the battery sector jobs are primarily non-union and pay less than ICE jobs, and so there's a problem with job quality. Policy support can minimize worker dislocation, job loss, wage loss, and the decline of unions, but it's going to take some intention. Policy really needs to look at how to increase domestic content, develop the US supply chain, ensure continued innovation and competitiveness, improve job quality in order to attract and retain the qualified workers that we're going to need, mitigate local economic shock, shocks and spur uh, consumer demand. So there are some opportunities, but there are also some real challenges. Among these challenges are the geographic challenges. This map shows uh, the light vehicle production supply chain. The black dots show the um, assembly plants. The orange dots show the supplier plants. They're this is really concentrated in certain geographies. And if ICE jobs are not replaced locally, some communities will be exceptionally hard hit. Even if EV and battery jobs do replace ICE jobs, there could still be reduced uh, wages and job loss. So we absolutely have to get this transition right from the worker perspective and the political economy perspective and the geographic perspective. What does this mean in terms of our thinking around workforce development? Well, we know that a qualified and available workforce is going to be really key to building out the lithium battery supply chain in the US. 
But we also know that when workforce development efforts focus solely on training, we can't solve the problem. Training alone can uh, is a supply side strategy that can produce a lot of workers into the labor market. But if there aren't good quality jobs for them to go into, uh, we're going to have a problem attracting and retaining the workers that we need. So to quote an article from December from the Aspen Institute, workforce development should focus more on fixing work, not just the workers. Job quality is key to attracting and retaining qualified workers. And job quality, uh, we have a problem here because in announced battery plants, the job quality is worse than in powertrain plants. Wages average 1950 an hour and almost all with one exception are non-union. There are also significant public costs of both job loss and poor job quality. The estimated social cost of closing a plant is $150,000 to $350,000 per worker. There's also public costs of low wages. A study from UC Berkeley a few years ago showed that production line workers generally, not only for battery manufacturing or in advanced manufacturing, but generally enroll in federal safety net programs at the same rate as workers in the fast food industry. So these manufacturing jobs are not what they used to be despite uh, massive improvements in worker productivity. Fixing the jobs, fixing the quality of jobs is going to be key to our workforce efforts. So how does this influence how we're thinking about our workforce priorities? One, like I've said, we need to grow jobs through uh, efforts that support the development of domestic supply chains particularly in energy and automotive communities that face transition risks. And we need to improve the quality of jobs. And this includes supporting efforts to increase unionization in the battery supply chain and EV supply chain and other clean energy supply chains. When we do think about the workforce education and training side of it, we really need to center both worker and employer needs and make sure that both workers and employers are well represented in the development of training standards and in the development of training programs. A few ways to do that are to support labor management training partnerships. These can focus on both worker and workplace health and safety on the training that can support workers advance in their careers, not just get that first job. Uh, and that look for other opportunities to advance the firm competitiveness through workforce development, something that both the employers and the workers would benefit from. Uh, we're also looking at how to how to coordinate with the Department of Labor and expand registered apprenticeships and manufacturing apprenticeships, registered apprenticeships or earn as you learn models of training that result in national industry recognized credentials. These work really well in the construction sector. And there's a lot of other industries that registered apprenticeship would be a good model for. Sometimes in, in construction, we see this a lot. These registered apprenticeships are jointly funded by both labor unions and employers because both sides benefit from that investment in training. That's what we need to see more of in the manufacturing space. Additionally, the last thing that's going to work is to have dozens or scores of different training programs across the country leading to different certifications or different credentials. Workers don't know what to make of that employers don't know what to make of that and that is not the path to support improved job quality or targeted investments in the communities that need them so one of the things that we think is really important is to engage industry leaders and labor in the development of national training standards that lead to industry recognized credentials so workers know where to invest uh, in their skill development and education that is going to lead to a job and upward mobility within that job and, and within that career. And that employers will also know what does, a, what does the particular credential signal in terms of worker competencies. So that standardization is really, really essential. In closing, 
I just want to say that this is this is a challenge that we are up for. This is possible. It's really exciting to think about how to build a new industry right from the get go, an industry that will support good high road, good paying union jobs and increase US competitiveness. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm Shalonda Baker, and I'm so proud to serve as the nation's first ever Deputy Director for Energy Justice in the Office of Economic Impact and Diversity. I want to thank Argonne Lab for hosting this two day convening where we are all focused on bridging the gaps to advance our nation's battery manufacturing, recycling, and supply chain. Argonne and DOE's other 16 national laboratories lead the nation in advancing the frontiers of scientific knowledge and innovation, keeping our nation secure, and fueling our clean energy economy. And the simple truth is diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility are essential to achieving these goals. The innovation at the heart of the laboratory's success benefits from diverse talent and inclusive perspectives. We can and should work together to make sure we are maximizing diversity in talent and inclusivity in perspective. It's my office's mandate to ensure that people of color are afforded opportunities to participate fully in our nation's energy programs. And as part of that, we must all think create creatively and critically about how the battery manufacturing and recycling industry can be more inclusive as we expand and electrify our transportation infrastructure and as we transform ourselves into a clean energy economy. And so in alignment with these goals, we're working hard daily to expand the participation of minority owned businesses in DOE programs and to increase access to new opportunities. So we see the bipartisan infrastructure law or the bill as an important vehicle to do this. The bill is a long overdue investment in our nation's infrastructure, workers, families, and competitiveness. The battery provisions we are discussing today represent over 6 billion, that's billion with a B, dollars to advance the science and innovation required to meet the demand and to drive our nation forward. It's our belief that the bill provisions are incredibly important in not only addressing our infrastructure needs, but also advancing equity. These provisions will be the vehicle to provide jobs, jobs in BIPOC and low-income communities who have unfortunately disproportionately borne the environmental burdens of the energy system while reaping so very few of its economic benefits. And we also see opportunities for grants for minority owned businesses and nonprofits. We encourage the creation and prioritization of business models that are people and community centered. So all of you present today represent the innovation and ingenuity we need to make this possible. I want to impress upon you that your work must be inclusive of minority serving institutions, community colleges, technical training programs, and the workers who will be local to and will most likely be impacted by this work. We encourage you to push the levers of creativity to conduct this work in a manner that is respectful of our environment, our resources, and our people. Environmental justice principle must also be core to your projects. You must acknowledge the potential environmental harms associated with the lithium and cobalt extraction process, as well as the excessive use of water that impacts the communities living near these mines who may be negatively harmed uh, with the loss of access to clean water, or who may be dependent on land and waterways for farming and fishing. So local consultation and meaningful engagement must be a critical part. Both of these things must be critical um, 
within all of our projects to mitigate further harm to these communities who are already burdened by the climate crisis and who have experienced generational harms within their environments. So if you're not sure how to lead this important work with these ideals of equity in mind, our office, the Office of Economic Impact and Diversity, is a place for you to receive guidance and resources. And finally, finally, we must work hard to maximize the benefits of every single dollar spent through this battery manufacturing and recycling program to ensure that 40% of the overall benefits of these investments flow to frontline underserved and overburdened communities. This is the essence of the historic Justice 40 initiative, which holds the promise of transforming, yes, transforming communities. And so we, all of us, have the responsibility to ensure that the communities on the front lines of this climate crisis receive the benefits of the transition. This is the promise of an equitable clean energy transition. This is your work today. This is our work together. And this is the promise of the Biden-Harris administration. And I should also say that this is the moment that we've been waiting for. This is the moment we've also been training for and been dreaming of. And I am so honored to work with committed and incredibly smart colleagues across the national labs, across the Department of Energy, to help us transform the nation and our world. So this is our moment and you have your work cut out for you. I look forward to working with you as we transform our nation's energy system into one that is more clean, that is equitable, and that is just. Enjoy this conference. Thank you. So I've already sort of say that those were fantastic comments from both Bethany and Shalanda. They've been thinking about this deeply and I've had a huge influence in terms of how to think about this whole topic. I wanna to bring in Michael Abarube, who you heard from this morning, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Sustainable Transportation, to share a few of his thoughts on what we just heard and the whole concept of, you know, how do we think about the environmental justice component, the equity, the whole workforce. And then I wanna then bring on my colleagues from other national labs to have a discussion on what we've been hearing from the audience. Go ahead, Michael. Thank you, Ben Kat. Um, I, I've had the honor of working with Shalanda and with Bethany um, over the last uh, eight, nine months. And, you know, first, let me just say, just having them here in this position in senior roles within the administration and like actively working, like, you know, day to day, week to week with us is new and that's different. And that in and of itself is uh, a, a real sign of change. Um, and it's going to be something that um, we are going to be asking all of all of you and the people that we are working with in, in funding, you know, and all the projects Dave talked about earlier and in the, um, the competitive grants under bill. This is critically important. Um, I think, you know, Shlanda and, and Bethany said it well, I, I will say kind of in my own words, if we don't bring everyone along and if everyone doesn't see their role in this energy transition we will not succeed it, it won't make a difference how many billions we spend so this isn't um something to do on the side or an add-on this is core to the success as much as you know the it is the getting the right factory and the right technology and the, the right offtake agreements and all of that are needed this also is needed as well um I, I'll just echo you know, Bethany's comments on quality of jobs, location of jobs. Um, so one of the things you will see, for those of you that have applied to some of our funding opportunities recently, um, we are asking for a diversity, equity, and inclusion plan in every one of our funding opportunities. Um, these programs under Bill are, are huge and monumental, and that has to be part of it. Uh, as Shalanda said, there needs to be meaningful engagement and listening with the local community and involvement of the local community. And we are gonna be asking in our projects for, for that, for that demonstration of that. Um, we will be giving very serious consideration to locality for people that are energy communities in transition, automotive, basically people that are transferring for the fossil energy 
uh, industry. And so in the case of automotive, you know, whether that's making the internal combustion engines or similar other components, or in the actual energy, you know, for example, coal communities that are, you know, in transition as we move to renewables to get that clean electricity to, to run those cars. Um, the location of facilities that are in those same communities that can provide job opportunities to those workers that are going to be transitioning out of those is a top consideration we will be looking at. So please take that quite seriously in, in the work that, uh, that you're doing. So uh, with that, Venkat, let me hand it over to, uh, to you and Noel and uh, I think maybe Tony who is going to join as well. I'll gladly stay on it for any comments at the end or any questions you guys may have for me. That'll be fantastic if Noel and uh, yeah, Tony's on. I see Noel, if you can come on to that's fantastic. Uh, so, you know, uh, great comments. I had a couple of questions I wanted to pull the thread on, maybe a combination of uh, engaging the community and workforce maybe in the beginning. What are you guys hearing? We've already heard from a couple of people talking about engaging the local community college. Uh, you know, in Illinois, I won't mention names of companies, but we've seen, you know, manufacturers reach out to the community college and find a way to sort of get that kind of going. What are you hearing from companies and what do you think are some interesting practices we ought to be thinking about as we think about this growth of this market? Maybe we'll start with uh, Noel, but then go to Tony and then, you know, I, Michael, I would love for your views also on this topic because you've been thinking about it. So go ahead, Noel. Sure. Well, um, just to remind us of some, some of what we heard from industry just today in the areas of interest, we heard Lithium Americas talking about working with local partners to equip, equip local people on skills uh, and, and how they wanna build that community. We heard from Pure Lithium on how they're training technicians with high school backgrounds, for instance. And I'll say something that I've said in testimony to Congress and in the Energy Storage Grand Challenge national meetings that we held last year, that we need to be making these connections from K-12 to community and technical colleges, as you heard from Bethany, and sometimes also on to four year in, in grad schools, but it's about educating on the opportunities in energy and energy storage so people understand the opportunity at this time. Uh, it's about eliminating the shock points um, where you lose people in the pipeline and it's about creating those innovative training and reskill or upskill opportunities to meet our national needs and part of the need here and where the government could help is creating uh, an understanding of where the gaps are. Uh, and, and that's why it's really important for us to bring industry together to hear from them as well. Yeah, there was a poll question. If you have time, that's going to come up on that exact question, hopefully. But uh, Tony, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So I think we saw in the in your polls that the workforce is the biggest challenge that people are facing here. The general piece that that's come up in many of our conversations is we tend to focus in the research communities and the DOE on four school, you know, graduate school and things like that. But a lot of the, the effort is needs to be at the you know two year pre pre graduate education work and and getting those workers in and skilled up and in what are completely new areas for most people even in the training space. So I think figuring out how to de develop an apprenticeship type approach or connected with community colleges or trade school pieces is sort of critical to a lot of these industries moving forward in a way that they think they can accelerate through this work, um, get, you know, supply gap. I, you know, I cannot agree more, right? I think that's one of the biggest things that, you know, it's a mental pivot that all of us have to make and sort of where the needs are going forward. Michael, your thoughts on this, I was intrigued by, I know you've been thinking about this whole ICE to EV transition and what does it mean for the workforce? Um, I will, uh, I, I think Tony, your comments, Noel, are, are right on point. Um, not, not to, um, steal the secretary's thunder because that would be a bad thing for my career uh but uh, pay attention friday the secretary will be making an announcement uh, uh that's relevant to this conversation um so we see the need and we at doe are going to let's say we'll start the process but consistent with my theme from earlier today we can start and do the first small piece at the end of the day the lift that is needed here you know we're one hand it's it's the getting the hundreds uh, the 323 people that are on here today, the many companies uh, behind it. Um, but I do think the, the workforce training and it's, you know, there are very specific things um, about how you do that, the job classification, the skills, um, just so that people, you know, one of the things we've been doing is we've been having listening sessions, meeting sessions with all the major trades and talking to them about these provisions and what, what do they see and what do they need. Um, so I, I think that there is a path here we can do. I, um, one other thing I'll comment on, it was interested when I 
who was meeting with the EC earlier this week, they said that they have heard this question of the workforce training. They have a plan in place. I don't know how many countries in the European Union they've identified to train 15,000 workers per country through an initiative. Uh, and we talked about let's let's team up because there are, while they're certainly unique because something's unique, certain of the things are core. And a number of the companies are all the same companies, right? Whether you're operating in Europe or the US. So can we have some sharing on that? And that's part of what our, our work hopefully between um, the, the two you know, associations will be. Thank you, Michael. That's, you know, that's a very important point. I see something in the comments also about the European Mission Oriented Innovation Framework. Maybe that brings up the question of this sort of this uh, whole environmental piece, the local community. We've we heard a couple of presentations talk about sort of that engagement. Maybe this time, Tony, we want to start with you. Are you hearing things that are important here that we should be thinking of? Yeah, I think I think there's a this this comes back to this big picture of how the whole ecosystem is going to change. One of the things that we saw in some of the mining is how you engage the local communities and and so on. One, and I'm curious on Michael's perspective on this. One of the things that we're going to see is effectively a decrease in carbon-based jobs, whether it's oil or coal and so on. Those communities may not be in the same place, but they may have the right skill sets for these other things. How do we deal with that? How do we transition that skill set? What are highly skilled labor, you know, um, workers into opportunities, but maybe not even in the same state? So that transitional piece, I think, would be something to think about is how we do that. You know, this is this is a huge challenge. Um, the reality is you, you can't ask a family necessarily to uproot themselves and move. Um, but, you know, but look, we have to be realistic. It's not going to work in every case. So I think what we, what we do actually is in the cases where there is the opportunity to have variation in that location, to take advantage of that. Obviously, if you're talking about extracting or, or processing oil that's being extracted, it's got to be where it is. Um, so in some of those cases, maybe they were similar to coal, but maybe not. And I think there, to your point, Tony, you can offer the opportunity, improve the skill set. Um, and over time, maybe that, that helps work out. Uh, and then we have to do other things for the people who are in those communities that are losing those jobs, trying to other job opportunities uh, in, in other places. Maybe it's in renewables. Um, so, but yeah, it, it's, you know, we can't be Pollyannish about it either, right? Um, so real challenges. Noel, additional thoughts? Sure, yeah. So when I think about equity, there's so many different ways you could cut it uh, and apply it to what you're talking about. So when I think about energy storage, you know, one of the things I think about is um, energy storage enables us to make a move to clean energy, which avoids the need for frontline communities that are dealing with power plants, et cetera. But also, you know, Shalanda and Michael, you were talking about this too, how we need this represent representational type justice where we have local consultation from the very beginning on these kinds of projects. And we're working that hard for Lithium Valley and all of the other projects we're working on at Berkeley Lab. Um, but I, I, I think um, part, of, part of this we need to be thinking about is also uh, how different communities and, and different types of people are able to afford the technologies that we're coming up with. I mean, EVs are not in, in the realm of possibility for a lot of folks right now. And I know that things like fast charging, some in some senses have come about to help enable people to use this kind of technology when they don't have three hours or four hours to charge, when they don't have their own garage um, and when they, they just don't have access to that. So I just encourage people to think about, about um, equity from the very beginning. And I think you're hearing that throughout today and tomorrow as well. You know, know that comment, I think on the charging is one that uh, I, I'll try to remind people that Fast charging, by definition, is going to be more expensive charging, and um, this, this, we all know how that economics of that work. So that's not necessarily a great answer to say I'll buy a whole bunch of fast chargers in the middle of the city for people that you know are in lower income housing. So um, that is something we are interested in creative ideas and thinking about what type of demos and projects can we do here within DOE to help try to find solutions for that. Um, so that, that is going to be a big challenge. Uh, and I will say, you know, Shalanda put the offer out there for, for all of you, those of you on the call. If this, if this is a conversation that you're like, man, I'm a technologist. I'm a, I build factories. I've been, I, I, environmental justice, EJ40, this isn't my thing. What do I do? Where do I go? First, you know, don't feel out of place. I think the first thing to recognize is this is a conversation we have not been having. That's part of it, right? So it's uncomfortable. It's a new area. We should just all recognize that, but don't be afraid to engage in it because of that. And uh, Shalanda's team, uh, somewhere on the, 
on the call, put a note in the in the chat with contact information. Uh, they're here to help you think through, think through that. But what we do want to ask everyone, we're going to insist, is that you do your best. You do think through it. You address it. We're not expecting their perfect answers because if they were, it would already been done. But um, we do ask everyone to engage in the process and, and think through how best to answer these questions. And Michael, Kareen uh, from Shalanda's team is actually on the chat and she's put her contacts in for people to sort of ask those questions. Uh, I know we're running a little bit late on time, but I did want to ask something about permitting. And, you know, I, I don't know if I'm going to get to the poll questions today, but this just comes up all the time, right? The whole, you know, the questions in chat about, you know, oh, some countries, and I won't name countries, I'm too politically correct for that, you know, have no such issues, but, you know, we have these uh, questions that come up about permitting. And I wanted to start with Michael, you know, your thoughts on this question of, you know, how are we going to sort of uh, make permitting faster and get companies to sort of get uh, the rights to kind of do the things that they, they plan to do and want to do? Um, we are we're going to try to do a few things. First, we're going to learn from what we did on the solar site. Soft cost in general, let's say permitting of which is one, um, has been a significant issue in, in solar deployment. We are learning from that. Solar Office deployed a number of tools that we've heard have been very helpful. Some of that might be more relevant to the EV charging side than to large factory side. I think when it comes to big projects for, um, for minerals, big projects for plants, um, we don't have a silver bullet, but we're, we will be engaged, I guess, to try to help do that. I know this is a top priority across the administration, the White House. We are working on principles for, you know, um, how do you address things like sustainable um, extraction? How do you do that in the right way? And some core principles that hopefully we can get people bought into. So at least we're starting from part way down the conversation, not to allow we'll the whole thing done at the beginning, but um, versus starting from scratch and everyone approaching it differently. Well, thank you, Michael. That's extremely helpful. Uh, so thank you, all three of you. Actually, we are going to do a same kind of a session tomorrow. I just think this particular session can be a one-hour session all in itself, and we don't have an hour. We could have done that today. Tomorrow is going to be a pretty busy day, uh, but thank you all, all three of you, for taking the time to sort of talk a little bit about this. Uh, there's a bit of a debate going on on the site as to whether we should go to the polls or we should not go to the polls and get uh, you know, Dave Howell to kind of tell us a little bit about the final thoughts. But I wanted to thank all three of you for taking the time to sort of talk about this and, and for chatting the session and for giving uh, the keynote presentation in the morning. So Thank you I for including it. us. Our pleasure, Venkat. And uh, so we are actually going to go to Dave Howell, I think, because I just saw his camera come on and it is not for me to say that Dave should not say something. No, if you want to go to a poll, but I just want to make sure Michael, if he's still on, if you wanted to have any parting, parting words, you know, Michael, I know, has a, a meeting butted up right against 415. Is Michael still on? Michael, are you on? And are you able to say he may something? Have had to, he may have had to jump off. Okay. So did you want to do another poll? Um, no, go, go ahead. Uh, I think it's important <laughs> for you to sort of finish and then we can do the polls tomorrow and we'll integrate a way to do that, uh, David. So okay. Sorry. Now this, you know, I think what, what we really wanted to do is, um, is wrap up. And, um, and one of the things, let me just add a little comment on the um, permitting. Um, uh, the Bureau of Land Management has been part of our discussions within the Federal Consortium for Advanced Batteries. So we are we are discussing those items uh, with BLM and, and even with USGS and folks. So, you know, I, I just wanna say the conversation is taking place and it, it is really obviously, you know, it's a complex um, set, of, set of conversations, but we'll continue that uh, discussion as we, as we go forward. So um, excellent day, you know, on the East Coast, great afternoon for us. And, you know, really, uh, really appreciate all the input um, uh, that the participants uh, provided uh, today. Um, great videos. Um, uh, and uh, it obviously you put time, obviously a lot of time into, into making those videos and, and very impactful. So really appreciated they will be used and have been used. And so uh, particularly as, as you know, we get that information from you, um, you know, it will be, it will help us uh, here, me and, and my DOE team and the greater federal team as we build out this funding opportunity announcement in this phase one effort as we go forward. And, uh, and we'll, we'll continue to look at those. And those of you that, that stuck around and, and, and participated in the polling, you know, great questions, great polls, a lot of good insight there as well. So very valuable information. Um, uh, it, matter of fact, you know, it's just 
equally important input that we that we um, received um, from the polling. So thank you again, and particularly you know insights in those high priority areas within within those questions. Uh, yeah, thank you. And um, so as we build out this uh, this upcoming solicitation, you know, I, I will just um, just make sure that I I send you this message. You know, we. We, we do take time to build these things out. And, you know, every word, um, every paragraph is crafted. You know, we do have some boilerplate language and stuff like that, but I just want to encourage you that once the funding opportunity comes out, just to definitely read the entire document. And, you know, and if you have uh, questions, you know, there will be a frequently asked question capability for the funding opportunity as well. So feel free to, you know, put that question in question to us so we can actually get you an answer as soon as possible. And, uh, and we can just keep this process moving forward, um, you know, and, and as was input in some of the polling at, a, at an accelerated rate. And uh, so, um, so with that, you know, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Vincat and just want to say thank you to everyone. This has been very valuable to, to me and DOE and the federal team. And uh, let's keep this conversation going and moving forward. So Vincat. Thank you so much, Dave. I deeply appreciate it. I wanted to echo something Dave said, which is thanks to everybody for participating in the polls, also sending us your video recording. I know that we gave you guys two weeks time uh, to record those presentations. And even though it's only three minutes, we all know how long it takes to record a three minute video. It does take a long time to do that. So we deeply appreciate the time we've taken to do that. Uh, we are gonna have a similar session tomorrow, except a longer session. We will be starting at 12.30 Eastern, like we did today. Uh, you know, please join us because we're going to be going through the second part of the uh, notice of intent, starting off from AOI 6 all the way. And there's a lot of presentations, very interesting ones. We'll talk a little bit about LiveBridge, but also spend some time and talk about the last part that we had, the session focused on equity, on permitting, on workforce, on EJ40. Again, the importance of the topic cannot be uh, overstated. I think it's very important for us to think through that. So thank you again for a fantastic day today. Uh, like we said before, all the videos will be at some point posted so we, we can see it. Uh, the, the information coming in chat, which is extremely useful for us, will be posted for all of you to see. Uh, all the polling questions will be posted with the responses that came out. Um, you know, again, thank, we want to, again, thank you all for engaging and taking the time to do that. It's, it's been a fantastic uh, set of uh, information that has been coming to us. So appreciate it. See you all. Have a great rest of the day and see you all tomorrow, 1230 Eastern.